A very good afternoon to everybody and welcome to the Overview and Scrutiny Board, uh, the first of two today, the two o'clock meeting on the 11th of November, November 2019, uh, dealing with the call for evidence uh, around 5G connectivity. Um, I'll pass over to Democratic Services around housekeeping and uh, apologies. Thank you. Thanks, Chairman. Uh, please note that this Overview and Scrutiny Board meeting is being audio recorded by the Council for the purposes of publishing on the Council website in due course. Please can I remind members and officers and members of the public who are speaking to use their microphones when speaking. The meeting may also be audio recorded and or filmed for live or subsequent broadcast by members of the public. There are no scheduled fire alarm tests. If the alarm goes off, please leave through the emergency exit at the back of the room and assemble at the front of the building by the public toilets. Finally, please could mobile phones be turned off or switched to a silent setting for the duration of the meeting. Thank you. Item 1, apologies. Apologies have been received from Councillor Mike Brook, Councillor Millie Earl, Councillor Rachel Maidment and Councillor Chris Rigby. Substitute members, Councillor Richard Burton is here for Councillor Brook, Councillor Tony Trent is here for Councillor Earl, Councillor Marcus Adams is here for Councillor Maidment and Councillor Lisa Northover is here for Councillor Rigby. Item 3, declarations of interest. Do members have any declarations of a disclo disclosable pecuniary interest or any other interest on the agenda item before you? So I'll record that as none. Item 4, public speaking. Uh, there are no public questions or petitions, but there are public statements from two members of the public. So I'd like to call Emma Johnson as the first speaker. Thank you. Um, I'm a solicitor turned energy healer. I am deeply concerned about the potential impact of microwave radiation from untested 5G technology on all living things. Did you know that 252 reputable EMF scientists from 43 nations presented a petition to the World Health Organization? Did you know that 5G is uninsurable, classified as a pollutant, and a high risk by Swiss Re Insurance Group? Did you know that 5G will have a massive carbon footprint? There has been no public consultation and no consent obtained to this worldwide experiment. I trust BCP Council will join Glastonbury, Frome, Totnes, Kingsbridge, Shepton Mallet and Wellington in applying the precautionary principle now. And second statement is Mike Ford. Um, first of all, just to put myself in, in context, I'm not against 5G as a technology. I am actually a technophile. Uh, any of my friends will actually say that I am a gadget freak, so it's not, a, it's not about the technology, it's purely about the health issues. And also, to quote a, a, a famous philosopher, I'm a, I'm a bear of very little brain, and long words bother me. So that's from the world of Winnie the Pooh, if you didn't know. <laughs> So in terms of my statement, it's, it's very brief. I have to think in terms of you know, high-level things. I, I'm not, not a detailed person. So, if you cannot answer these two questions positively, I suggest that the only option is to apply the precautionary principle and call a moratorium on the BCP 5G rollout. Do I sufficiently understand the components that fall under the umbrella marketing term 5G and what each of those elements offers over and above currently available technology. And secondly, in the absence globally and locally of an independent environmental impact assessment, am I satisfied that this new technology is safe to roll out in BCP, where I am tasked with the guardianship of the best interests of citizens and their surroundings? I did send this to all of the, uh, the councillors, and I got over three responses. That's four. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you very much, and thank you to um, both of the speakers this evening, to Emma Johnson and Mike Fort. Um, because this is a, a single 
item and single issue uh, over in scrutiny board, we will be dealing with um, parts of your statement within the, the, the course of the meeting itself. So thank you very much for your contribution. And, and first of all, a big welcome to uh, members of the board, uh, members uh, of other councillors, uh, and also all of the members of the public, who many of whom this is the second time they will have attended, um, because this is the second uh, of the meetings for the call for evidence. I thought it would be useful just to um, take you all on a, a little bit of a journey of where we've been on this call for evidence process because this is very new um, for the council and um, we've got a, a new overview and scrutiny methodology to start with and this is the first time we've done something like this. Um, the call for evidence on 5G connectivity came about really because we'd heard from businesses, organisations, uh, residents and ac academia uh, from across Bournemouth, Christchurch and Poole who have been making representations to the council and it seemed to um, be a very good idea to use uh, the platform that we've got here uh, to, to, to delve deeper into it. Um, so I thought I'd just take you through a little bit through the process that we've been to to date. Um, the, the first meeting we had, um, well, we've, we've called the evidence, hence the, the title for the call for evidence, which opened on the 10th of September. And uh, we invited written sub, um, submissions to be provided uh, to the board and all members of the board and indeed the wider uh, membership of the councillors have ac had access to all of those written submissions as well. We had a first overview and scrutiny board meeting around this issue on the 23rd of September where we were in listening mode. That's where we heard the verbal submissions for the call for evidence and we had a number of speakers from lots of different sides presenting their opinions and evidence to us. The closing date for the written submissions was the 7th of October and uh, today is the, the second stage of the call for evidence. The first stage was in listening mode. Uh, today is for the board to be taking on board the evidence and opinions that they've heard to date and looking at, at what happens next. The key lines of inquiry that we looked at um, in the very first meeting was to, to, fall, uh, to follow two very broad questions. First of all, what are the perceived benefits to the area as a result of the implementation of 5G? Um, and secondly, what are the perceived concerns relating to the implementation of 5G? Uh, and we heard from a number of speakers in the first one, uh, and I think we had a very balanced view, actually, from, uh, from different sides. It wasn't intentional. We, we opened it up to everybody to, um, uh, to, to provide uh, the evidence and opinions that they wanted to. Um, so we're now coming to, uh, by the way, the written evidence uh, that we asked for was quite substantial. Um, so it, it does detail this in the report that many of you will have seen and, and is available at the back of the room today. But in total, we got 222 written responses, uh, both via hard copy and via email, which I think is a real testament not only to the level of public interest around this issue, um, but to the fact that people actually thought it was worthwhile to, to write to us and that their views would be listened to. So um, we'll be going into more of that evidence later on in the meeting um, but you know to say certainly from the, the, the board's point of view from the chair and the vice chair thank you very much to everybody that took part in the process and I hope you think that it will um, it has been and will continue to be worthwhile um, so moving on to the, the options before us and what can we do with this from here on in um, we've obviously got the evidence in front of us and today we'll be considering that and there are a few options available to this board the overview and scrutiny board is not a decision making body but what it can do is, is use a platform that we've got to look into things in a much deeper level uh, and then to make recommendations forward so the options that we do have available to us are firstly to commission further overview and scrutiny led work on the matter of 5G connectivity. Um, secondly, to report the findings for the call for evidence and or make recommendations to other parts of the council, for example, cabinet or full council, or externally, um, i.e. to other specified external bodies such as Public Health England, um, or to do nothing whatsoever. And I hope we won't end up with that one, but obviously we have to see how it goes today. Um, so that is uh, the summary of what we can do. Uh, we have a lot of options available to us, and I hope as we move through the meeting, um, particularly, hopefully, thematically, we can take each of the areas in turn and decide uh, what, if anything, we would like to do or see happen in terms of those areas. So, as I mentioned earlier, part one, the first meeting, was very much uh, us in listening mode. We heard from a lot of members of the public, a lot of external organisations, and the board had very little input themselves into that because that's not what that meeting was about. It was for us to listen to you, to all of you. Um, and at that point, Overview and Scrutiny did not express its view. We, we simply took it all in. Um, we 
are now in part two, and that is very much as I've ex expressed what we do next. Um, and I think it's um, important that we, we do this properly. It, I think it's very interesting. Those of us that were involved in the shadow authority before the inception of Bournemouth Christchurch and Poole, um, we remember when the Shadow Authority was looking at how the new uh, system for scrutiny was going forward, there was a recommendation for something called the Listening Committee, which I think was a, a very noble recommendation because it was um, an acceptance of the fact that quite often councils don't listen enough. Um, and I think it was a very uh, welcome idea. I think the problem with that listening committee that those of us had at the time is it's all very well to listen, but you've got to do something with it, and that had no power. So I'm very keen that we use the platform that we've got here to show that not only we're listening, but we're actually doing something with the views and evidence that's being presented to us. So that's a bit of a, um, a, a roller coaster summary on, on how we've got to this position to date. Um, in terms of moving forward into the meeting proper, on Saturday, um, it's come to my attention from officers that the BBC ran um, a little um, segment on 5G, which I think very neatly summarises some, um, some of the views that have been expressed to date. Um, and it is 10 minutes long, and I thought it would be a good opportunity to play that. It does come... It does have some opinions in there, so um, I think be mindful of the fact that this is not a, a full summary, uh, and of course some of the opinions and evidence that they provide in there I'm sure will be coming to later. But it struck me as a very neat little summary um, within 10 minutes of actually some of the issues that we may want to explore today, and certainly some of the issues that have become prevalent through the written and verbal submissions that have come to date. So, um, Councillor Ienga. Sorry, uh, Chair, can I just clarify what we're about to see, um, the, the context in which we're watching it, listening to it, is again as just further background information, because obviously it's like a point of view will be put across. I haven't seen the piece, but I'm going to guess a point of view will be put across in it, and there's a risk, obviously, that um, that will obviously then have a sort of an effect throughout our meeting. So just uh, I, I say this even without having seen it. So are we clear on that kind of caution between uh, it's, ourselves? It's a, it's a yeah. very valid point, and that's why I caveated it with that it is not – it is – it, I think it's useful in, the, in a very short space of time without having to go through what is 5G, what, what does it do, what doesn't, all of those things. It does give a, a neat summary. You're quite right. It will have some views in there. And I think so long as the board is, is open to the fact that um, it is not an exhaustive summary, and of course there's lots of other evidence in there, um, it seemed to me a, a sensible springboard. Um, I'll, I'll seek the board's approval of whether we think it's a, a good catalyst for uh, the discussion. Councillor Farquhar. I'm glad to hear that you'll seek the board's approval. Um, I, can I move that we put it to the vote that we actually allow it to be sort of brought into evidence um, before it's actually shown? That seems completely appropriate to me. Any other... Uh, uh, do we have a seconder? So you wish to move that and Councillor Trent wishes to second. As I said at the beginning, the idea was not to be exhaustive or anything and actually uh, certainly don't, I don't think it's for us to agree or disagree with anything that's in there, but it is um, 10 minutes of a, a, a fairly decent summary of some of the issues. So um, any further? Are you, to be clear, Councillor Farquhar, are you moving that you want to see it or you don't want to see it? Okay. And Councillor Trent? Okay, so do, 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 so we have a proposer not to view the video. Do we have a seconder? There's no no seconders from the board. To not to see. Okay, so we have a proposal from Councillor Trent that we do see the video. Councillor Trent, could I ask you to use your microphone, please? Sorry. Microphone, microphone. Sorry. No, I'm just saying that the normal mode of operation of the BBC is that they have to produce balance, even though one side might be stronger than the other one. So I accept that this will be probably more balanced than um, some of the potential hearsay. OK. Um, Councillor Anger. Um, perhaps um, the BBC, like any, any company, is supposed to be balanced, possibly, but again, even without having seen the piece, we can't tell. Right. We can't tell, and I, I do worry because of the pizzazz and the way as such a video will be put across, it will disproportionately uh, sort of influence the discussion that ensues. <laughs> 
Okay. Colleagues, do you want to adjourn for a couple of minutes and perhaps discuss this further? Or, or are we are we happy to? I mean, the, the, like I said, the, the, this is a last minute because it Jane, came on I'm Saturday the, and it seemed to be a. It's only ten minutes. I'm happy for the video for us to see the, uh, view the video. So, so chair, chair, can I just suggest that uh, Councillor uh, Trent has made a move? Councillor Trent has made a move. For a second, uh, looking for a second. I believe that Councillor Mike Green has just seconded it. Councillor Mike Green. In which case, we have a, a move and a second. All those in favour? The, to watch the video, yes. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Any against? One, two. Can I ask that uh, my vote is Yes. Yeah. And any abstentions? Thank you. In which case we will move to the video, um, caveated, hopefully suitably discussed around the fact that it is uh, another bit um, that we will all take in the round uh, of the evidence, but the, the aim certainly is to um, provide a summary of the issues. So, thank you very much. Right. So thank you very much. As I think it, a bit of a useful summary of some of the issues, but of course, as we've seen, with 220 uh, written submissions, all of the evidence that we had in the first meeting, uh, including um, a, a lot of videos and um, uh, uh, video opinions and evidence um, through the written evidence as well, there's a lot for us to consider here. Um, but it, equally, I think a, um, a good whistle-stop tour of some of the issues that we may wish to explore this evening and to delve in deeper. So if we move to the, uh, the meeting properly, I'll pass over to um, uh, Lindsay just to, to highlight um, how people have responded and some of the respondents um, that have um, and, and some of the themes that have come up so far. And then what my aim to do for the meeting is to go through each of the different areas that have emerged from the evidence that's been presented in a, in a thematic approach so that we can try and um, uh, focus some of the energy and some of the discussion around some of the different areas and particular uh, and try and take them in turn rather than uh, try to do too much at once and have all of the evidence and then come to some uh, uh, bigger conclusions at the end. It seems sensible to me, particularly because a lot of the evidence that has come in has been about specific areas, to try and de deal with each of those in turn. So I'll pass over to uh, Lindsay. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I'm just going to give you an overview of the responses and how these have been presented to you today so you know what you're looking at. Um, as the Chairman said, in addition to the verbal submissions that were received on the 23rd of September and are outlined in your report, 220 written submissions were received in the call for evidence. Um, a wide variety of views were provided within those submissions. So these have been grouped into themes and where more than three people indicated the same view, those themes have been included. Um, many respondents referred to more than one theme and many of the themes overlap so it's important to note that the numbers listed in the themes won't add up to 220. Um, all members have been given access to all the responses that were received in, in writing um, so the full body of responses have been able to be viewed by all members um, but this is a summary of those responses. Um, Many respondents didn't include a clear for or against view in relation to 5G and indeed the question asked was what are the concerns and benefits and so um, um, there hasn't been a clear for or against view included within the outline here because that wouldn't be representative of, of what people have been putting forward. Um, Many of the respondents listed both concerns and benefits. Some listed just concerns, some just benefits, and many also included advisories. So the top line figures that are included in paragraph 9 for you are um, that those who highlighted only concerns were 96 respondents. Those who highlighted only benefits were 50. Those who um, referenced both concerns and benefits were 29 respondents. And um, those who did not indicate any concerns or benefits but made other comments in relation to 5G connectivity were 30. 
Um, at 10, you will see the list of organisations that responded to the call for evidence listed. And from paragraph 11 onwards, um, you'll see the themes that are outlined. Um, I, I'd suggest, Chair, if you're minded to, that the Board might want to explore the views within each collection of themes and have discussion around those. And I can highlight the key um, areas within each theme for you as we go through. The colleagues happy with that process? Um, in which case, let's jump into it. So the, the first area, um, and I think if we take them in, in order that they're presented in the port, a report for clarity as well. Um, so the first area of, of, of theme, if you like, are around general comments and advisory views. Um, Lindsay, I don't know whether you want to take us through some of the, the, the themes within the theme. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, if you look at paragraphs 11 to 18 in uh, your first appendix, you'll see the general comments and advisory views that were provided I suppose the key ones, the highest numbers to pick out for you are paragraphs 11 and 13, in which it says that 38 people indicated that 5G was just unrequired by them, or, or the BCP area. Um, and at 13, 35 people made reference to general coverage issues and speeds, needing improvement, such as 4G and broadband speeds. So those were two particular themes that came out. Um, but also included within that section are reference to the fact that wired solutions should be found instead of 5G wireless solutions. Um, people were concerned about future proofing of 5G. Would it, would it still work in a few years? Um, some people said that we should, BCP should do a full consultation with residents before introducing 5G. <coughs> Some said that uh, 5G is not a priority and that other council priorities should come higher. Um, some people said that we should be looking at what other areas are doing and what mistakes they're making before we, we pursue things. And um, three people said that 5G wasn't dangerous or was no more dangerous than other domestic appliances already in use. Thank you, Lindsay. So if we, if we start with those areas, particularly the ones that have re attracted the, the, the most comments, um, uh, we've invited um, some officers with us today. Um, so I don't know whether you want to um, go first and give us a bit of a summary on those. If you could introduce yourselves and also your roles. And I think it is also useful, as we expressed at the beginning, where possible within these areas, if we can try and focus on, on areas that we can actually have some input to, things that we can do. So, for instance, if there are concerns raised um, and there are things that the council can do would be very useful to hear what we can do and what we can't do as well so if I could pass over to you for a, a, an opening thank you so good afternoon um, my name is Ruth Spencer I'm the sector growth manager for creative and digital at BCP council um, so my role is looking at the creative and digital economy um, and understanding how uh, connectivity and innovation might help grow those economies um, but it's also starting to look at how those technologies might actually be able to benefit um, BCP council um, in tackling some of our kind of um, social challenges um, and environmental challenges as well I'm Adrian Hale. Um, my job title here says LTP engineer, which is um, a little bit obsolete now, but I've been effectively working with Ruth Spencer on our smart city, a smart place work for the last uh, couple of years. Great. Um, are you happy for me to just address the, the referring to point 11 in the document here, um, which um, indicates that um, a significant amount of people weren't actually sure why 5G was required or that 5G was unrequired. So I thought it might help if I gave a bit of useful context around the views that we've been collecting from um, across the UK, really, um, from other 5G pilots that are already taking place, um, as well as from the digital um, department of um, culture, media and sports, who takes the lead on um, the deployment um, of 5G technologies. Um, so one of the things to uh, maybe start with is that... Um, 5G technologies are really going to move connectivity from um, enabling our mobile phones to enabling things in machines. Um, and this is this is a, a key difference, really. Um, and one of uh, I thought it'd be useful to outline maybe three or four key differences within between a 4G network and a 5G network. 
Um, so in a 5G network, what that will actually a- a do is address a lot of challenges um, that 4G networks um, have at the moment. So particularly um, around 5G, what we're looking at is the ability to be able to have lots of devices connected to the network at any one time. Um, and to my previous point around it's not just about mobile phones anymore. It can be um, everything from um, sensors um, um, all the way through that you would um, use to monitor the environment all the way through to uh, sensors that will be in our clothes potentially in in the future there's there's also all sorts of um, uses so what we're looking at is the number of devices that potentially going to connect to the internet is going to increase and 4G technology won't be able to cope with that number of devices. So um, an example there is being able to um, manage our care, more effectively manage our health um, and we can come on to kind of specific use cases later in the in the discussion. Um, so the density or the number of devices is really important. Um, also the reliability of the 4G network compared to the 5G network is another theme um, that comes up. So So within the 5G network, what you're able to do is actually carve out bits of the network for specific uses. Um, So the 4G network becomes very contested because there's lots of people on the network. So when you look at things like the emergency services, what 5G will be able to do is actually carve out a bit of that network that will specifically be able to be used by um, the emergency services. And so you'll get that reliability that 4G might not be able to offer. Um, And the final thing to mention maybe is around the the delay that you get on a 4G network. So on a 4G network, um, the delay that you get from the device to the infrastructure and back to the device again um, is is significantly longer than in 5G. So in some use cases in 5G, what you will need to see is very low, what they call latency, which is the delay so in a, when you have low latency, you have very little delay. So an example here could be around connected autonomous buses in the future. If we're looking at managing, managing our um, congestion across our network better, we may want to, in the future, be able to have connected autonomous buses, which will rely on very little delay um, in order to operate. So there's a few examples there of the kind of core differences between the 4G and the 5G network. Um, and one of the things we're looking at potentially doing in the Lansdowne area is understanding what the benefits are and what the costs are and what the risks are of this technology in a little bit more detail. Thank you, Ruth, for that that immediate summary. Um, Colleagues, any um, questions around this particular issue? I'm quite happy to start if you like. I was was struck actually reading through a lot of the submissions um, in our call for evidence um, that there was quite a way, it's kind of referenced here, about 35 people um, that actually said... uh, all very well that you're progressing with 5G, but we haven't even got connectivity in other areas. What are your views around, um, is there sometimes a rush to the newest technology um, to the detriment of, of actually using existing things? I mean, you've explored how they are different, um, but do you have any views around um, the, the rush to, to the newest thing? Yeah, absolutely. I, I can take that and also refer to my colleague Adrian as well to build on that a little bit further. Um, but in terms of 4G, we're actually, and it's, it's really useful to see the number of people here that are actually, you know, noticing these not spots across the area, um, because it is it is a problem locally, and that's that's partly due down to the mobile network operators not investing in this area, um, because the te- this technology is very expensive to to deploy. Uh, so one of the things that we are looking at doing is working with the mobile networks much more closely to understand what their 4G deployment plans are so we can see whether those black spots um, kind of do do um, or can be improved. But I'll hand over to my colleague Adrian to talk about um, potentially how the market might fail in this area and potentially the interventions that might be required. Thank you, Ruth. Adrian? Yeah. So what we're finding is, like, for instance, Dorset at the moment um, has about 9% gigabit connected through, through fibre. Um, and in terms of 4G coverage, you know, there's, if you're around this area, there's, there's two issues normally. One is, issue is around not sufficient antenna being around, so people aren't getting a good signal. Uh, the other thing is it's just too contested, and that means that people, too many people. So if you're at a football match, for instance, you're watching AFC Bournemouth, um, and if you try to get on your phone at half time, uh, it's impossible. If actually you, you get a bit bored of the match and you turn it on through the second half, 
you will be able to get a signal. And that sort of emphasises the current problem. And so if you're like in the, the middle of Bournemouth, uh, the issue will be around too many people trying to contest the network. If you're sort of like in the, the far reaches of Christchurch, it's simply because the antenna aren't available, therefore you're not getting a signal. And that obviously has a, an effect upon businesses and, and the way people conduct their businesses. It affects the local economy. So there are things like, um, uh, you know, one of the things that we've been looking at is trying to quantify what the impact is upon the economy of um, poor connectivity, whether that be lack of fibre or lack of wireless connectivity. And at the moment, we're calculating uh, overall there's a deficit of about £1 billion in the BCP area. And, uh, and we reckon it's around about £250 million to £300 million per year uh, uh, deficit for the economy based on um, poor connectivity. So uh, we can't necessarily fix all of the problems. Uh, we have to work with the market and encourage the market uh, to accelerate uh, deployment of fibre and, and wireless. Uh, and that's the work that Ruth and I are doing. And one of the things that's been happening recently has obviously been the announcement from City Fibre about coming into the Bournemouth area um, of the BCP uh, region. But we need to get people to be deploying pan BCP so that everybody has that opportunity to get the connectivity that they need. Thank you very much. Um, Councillor Anderson. Microphone. Thank you. Um, one of the questions that I've been asked quite regularly is about the average distance between the masts, because people are saying there could be uh, several masts on the street, that uh, everyone's going to be plastered by masts, uh, the masts are going to uh, have to have trees chopped down. Uh, could you uh, clarify that? Yeah, unfortunately, our infrastructure manager, who's uh, uh, absolutely the technical expert on uh, these technologies, isn't here, he's had to go. Um, but what's happening with 5G, so we talk about it, it's not a new technology, actually. It's the same technology that's been used um, elsewhere. So, for instance, the, the, the frequencies that the mobile network operators are going to be operating at actually sits between the, the public Wi-Fi frequency. So public Wi-Fi operates at 2.8 gigahertz and 5 gigahertz. The, the mobile operators will operate at 3.5 gigahertz, so it's the same technology. But what you need to do moving forward um, is, is because of the, um, the signals can be quite weak, you have to have the antenna closer together, so that will have a detrimental effect upon um, you know, the visual effect in a local environment. But what that means is because the antenna are closer together, the energy levels that you actually need are a lot, lot lower than you would get from, say, 4G antenna. And so, you know, it goes into like, you know, micro milliwatts of energy. So, which actually makes it actually, in some respects, a safe technology. So what government talk about is, is a layering on of um, 5G. So obviously 5G will introduce um, extra layers of EMF, um, electromagnetic frequency um, pollution, if you like. Um, but... Um, is actually at a lower scale than other technology because of the energy levels from the antenna being closer together is a lot less. Thank you very much. Councillor Emerson? Um, can I also clarify... Trees. Yes. So, so in terms of the trees, uh, um, what, some of the work that we, uh, Ruth and I have been working on is um, ordnance survey mapping uh, local areas. So it's not our intention at all to cut down any trees and, and, we, and so that, that will not be happening. What we'll have to do is to work around the trees in order to make sure that we're deploying um, line of sight um, technology to actually avoid the trees. So we're actually placing the antenna in the optimum areas so you actually avoid taking trees down. So you actually plan for that as opposed to taking the trees down. So, so that's what we intend to do. Thank you, Chairman. And if I think we'll be um, coming on to more of the, the planning-related yeah. issues a little <coughs> bit later on. I just had uh, one more point, Chairman, on this. Okay. Um, you mentioned about City Fibre. Now, I, as far as I'm aware, City Fibre is totally different from the 5G network because it's, uh, they're introducing uh, fibre to the, the, the floor spec. Can you confirm that? Yeah, so what City Fibre, it is, it is a fibre programme, so it's, it's a fixed um, wireless programme. It's not a, a wireless programme. Um, so what City Fibre are doing is providing gigabit fibre to the home. So, um, yes, and, and the more fibre we get, the better that is for the, uh, the local economy and for local people as well. Thank you very much. Um, we've got a few other speakers. Councillor Lawton. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, can you, uh, I was interested before, uh, the blue lighting services, the emergency services, you, you mentioned those. Could you please expand on what the benefits would be to those services? Would it be life-saving uh, measures, etc.? 
So, and, no, thank you for the question. Um, so we've, we're working on two, we call them use cases, which I guess is examples of how we, we think this technology is going to work, what the costs are, what the benefits are, what the risks are. And we've been working with Dorset um, Police um, about doing a, a use case which enables officers to stream CCTV footage um, from the op centre directly to their mobile phone. Um, what happens at the moment is that they arrive um, to an incident um, uh, potentially with only verbal descriptions of what that incident is. So what they have is the value of actually seeing the CCTV footage in real time in high quality. Uh, so they're able to actually arrive at an incident much more prepared um, than they would have been um, without, that, without that footage. As we move forward, there's also the opportunity to bring in other types of CCTV to be streaming such as drones streaming that um, footage from drones into the officers mobile as well um, so the I, the benefits specifically would be officers being prepared um, so partly you know enabling the safety of officers on the street but hopefully better outcomes for people um, and safer environments for people because they're able to resolve that um, kind of um, much more successfully um, and that that use case with developing all the way from just uh, in, um, an officer arriving at an incident all the way through to prosecution so there's a kind of a pathway of benefits that we're working on but that first phase is just um, been identified at the moment. Um, a second um, use case we're exploring actually is around the um, ambulance services. So there's a pilot project in the West Midlands at the moment and they've been trialling connected ambulances. Um, and what this, the problem that they're trying to solve at the moment is paramed <coughs> paramedics, when they're in an ambulance with a patient, aren't actually able to um, conduct an ultrasound. So what they're, able, what they're looking at at the moment is how do they connect the 5G ambulance through to the hospital. And a, um, a consultant at the hospital will wear a haptic glove and actually virtually um, help the paramedic do the ultrasound in the ambulance. So what you have there is you're increasing the skill set of a paramedic um, and, and enabling him or her to understand um, you know, how, how to essentially conduct <coughs> that procedure which ultimately wouldn't have been able to be conducted by him or her um, using expertise at the hospital. So when they then arrive at the hospital they're able to be have prepped the um, capability and the capacity that they need to then deal with that incident. So that's something that the West Midlands Testbed uh, pilot programme are looking at at the moment um, and it's a, a conversation we're having with the clinical commissioning group about whether they see value um, in, in, in rolling out a similar use case here. Thank you very much. Councillor Lawton. So what you're saying, it may well have uh, life-saving value. Absolutely, yeah, that's what we're looking at. Thank you, thank you Councillor Lawton and uh, Ruth Spencer. Um, I'll move on to the next speaker. If I could just ask um, uh, those that are not um, on the board to try and keep their comments to a minimum. This is the, the, the second meeting we've had. The first meeting was uh, about hearing from uh, non-members of the board. This is for the board to de delve deeper, and we will be going through the different evidence areas. So I appreciate there's a lot of um, uh, people that have um, a lot of interest in this, but it would be courteous to uh, give people the ability to speak and ask and answer questions politely. Um, I'll move on to Councillor Ayinga. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I think at this early stage in the discussion, I've still got two questions <clears throat> in my mind, which I will keep in mind as we go through this. What one is kind of, um, it, it, it's sort of it, the case for more connectivity, whatever the solution we choose for it, the case for more connectivity. And the second question, independently of that, is, is 5G that solution? And I think they're two very, very different questions. In my mind, I feel warmer about the first question, about the answer probably being yes. Um, coming from an economic background, this neck of the woods in the country, I don't want to see us, see us economically slip further behind. And the way of the future is generally, sad to say, because I'm a bit of a techno-phobe, whatever there is, rather than a file, um, is that things where there's more connect connectivity between gadgets, data analytics, and so on, that is probably the, the future of work in a broader sense. And we certainly don't want to be behind the pace in that kind of thing, even if we're not the, the vanguard of it. Um, the, um, I must say, I'm not... If the future of this, if the epitome of the future of this is someone being able to make a phone call at half time, I, I'm not behind that kind of vision for our region, I have to say. But if it's, for instance, genuinely for things such as emergency services, as Councillor Lawton said, if it's about healthcare, for instance, genuinely enabling better healthcare, more responsive 
personalised healthcare at home, if it's genuinely we can make that link to it, then connectivity must be probably be a very good thing, um, and more broadly um, economic, whether it's exporting, importing, and so on. Okay. So on the requirement, and probably I will listen to the comments, but I feel warm about we need a lot more connectivity in this neck of the woods. The, but the bit about whether this is the solution or not, uh, you've gone through more devices, more reliability of network, and a shorter delay in response. Those are your three points I went. I think um, it's almost like it's a bit even, Stephen, at the moment, really. And the video, sorry, I do feel vindicated about my concern about the video. Um, they couldn't help giving a view at the end of that video, could they, which is, it's all all right. Yeah. And, um, you know, that's, that's, that's what any media company does. And uh, just I still think, actually, there's more to plunder in that particular one as to, um, as to whether we actually need 5G on this. One final thing, by the way, sorry, just in response to which, Chairman, you asked a question to us, which is, um, do we need to sort of leap to a solution? I think in terms of technology and connectivity, I've got a feeling we've, got, we've actually lagged up quite a way behind some of the areas of the UK, and most certainly internationally. So if, and only if, this was seen to be... Um, safe and so on. I see no reason why we shouldn't make a leap because we're so far behind other areas, but it's got to be absolutely safe. And I will, I will yeah. keep tabs with this discussion. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much, um, Councillor Ainger. There wasn't um, a, a question in there, so I'll, I'll move on to the... Um, uh, no, it's not, it's not a criticism because that's what we're here. We're here to uh, discuss and put our views as well. So I'll move to Councillor Bartlett. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I think the point you raised initially, Chair, uh, on this particular section was we have actually got 4G out everywhere at the moment. So, you know, we're making all this fuss about 5G, but we haven't even got there with, uh, with 4G. And I wanted to comment on that bit of it. Uh, and, and I'd just go back to when the M1 was first built. Uh, would you stop using the M1 because the rest of the network, motorway network, wasn't available generally around the country? The same happened with telephone lines. Lots of villages didn't get any telephones for years and years and years. When 3G was initially rolled out, very poor mobile signals. And the same, we've got this relentless march of technology where we're moving forward into this very exciting digital age. And uh, the sort of things that we're being offered now in terms of 5G offers some enormous leap forwards for society and mankind, actually. So, you know, this is not small beer we're talking about here. Um, it seems to me the issue about 5G, and we're going to be talking, I'm sure, about just about everything else, but the six to $4,000 question here, is it safe? And that is the crux of the matter, I think. Uh, and so I'm looking forward now to the discussion that will focus on that aspect of it, because I think no one, or I don't think most rational people can deny the huge benefits that will come initially as, a, as we move forward with technology, which, which, is, which is on us already, actually, and I'm not even sure we can do anything to realistically to stop it. Uh, but So I look forward to the bit where we get on to the safety issues, because like the, the, the film said, I was sort of in the middle here. You know, I, I can be swayed one way or the other on the safety issues, because I just don't know, actually. You know, I, I, I read the paper on one side of here, what the, uh, what the government is saying and all the national standards, international standards and everything. I know I've got this gut feel, and particularly when I see a couple of little comments in here, like it shouldn't be or it may be, you know, it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not, a, it's not a definitive statement. You know, it's, it's not definitive, even in, this, even in the standards being produced uh, under national guidelines. So... I'll say no more at this time. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, and we will be coming on to those issues um, uh, very, very shortly indeed. Councillor Farquhar. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, I had one question initially um, based upon um, <coughs> the question in the presentation so far, but um, just to Councillor Bartlett's uh, point, whereby technology is marching forward and we leap forward and so on and so forth, in a much younger life, and when I was a lot slimmer and a lot less hairy than I used to serve in uniform, uh, we used military technology, including uh, radio systems, um, which at that time we had to sign um, an official secrets act because the technology was, um, it's probably all plastered over the internet now, or Wikipedia, etc. But the technology was such that we didn't want um, those that would do the UK harm to know about the technology we were using. But even as a young soldier, then what we were briefed with and the technology that we were using was going to cause us harm. 
on the radio systems. We had a nickname for those that were permanent radio operators, and they were scalybacks. And the reason for that is because the radiation that was all pointed out to us would harm us if we actually had it physically on our back and we used it. So the nature of the technology which we're looking at here actually comes, to my understanding, from military um, technology, whether it be from America or the UK and so on and so forth, for these radio technologies and these microwave technologies. But I just wanted to share, before I ask my question, the fact that, yes, technology moves on, but I'm going back about 30 years, and it caused harm then. So, to Councillor Bartlett's point, in that 30 years, at what point has the evidence been brought forward to say it doesn't cause harm now? My actual question, Foe, was that um, you uh, undertaking surveys to put the, uh, the, the network in, um, or the trees, um, so that they don't come into conflict, so you can have this, this low power um, that will be interfered with trees. This council has declared a climate and ecological emergency. Um, we have undertaken to lower our carbon footprint by 2030 to make it neutral. Everything which we introduce as a council has to have two criteria. One, is it for the welfare and the well-being of the residents and citizens of the conurbation? And the second one is what is this impact on that declaration that we've made that we've got a climate emergency for the carbon footprint? Now, I'm not a great ecological warrior, but to my understanding, in this country and anybody that actually wants to tackle carbon change to make it carbon neutral, then it's planting trees. So my question to you is, when you're making these surveys, if let's say that the council is going to undertake to plant 200,000 more trees, how is that going to affect your plans to roll out the 5G network so that it doesn't interfere with what you plot, particularly when you say that it's an expensive technology to uh, deploy? And the question is, if it's an expensive technology to, to deploy, will the tree planting have to give way to the fact that there's an antenna there already? We... Thank you, Councillor Parkour, for your question... We were due to go on a little bit later to the environment and ecological concerns, but if there's any input you want to put now, or we can we can park that one and maybe come back to it under that heading. I think. Are you okay with that, Councillor Parkour? Yeah, it's it's coming up shortly. Um, so we will we will definitely deal with that issue though. Um, Councillor Northover. Thank you, Chair. Um, in paragraph 17, it says that people have suggested we should allow other areas to test. Um, I wondered if you know if other areas are doing any testing, and if we go ahead with the Lansdowne um, project, would uh, we have any testing as part of that? So one of um, the work streams that we're, we're looking at at the moment is what we can learn from other places. So um, the Department of Culture, Media and Sport um, run a 5G test bed and trials programme. Um, this has been uh, operational for a couple of years now, and there are now five or six funded pilots across the UK, which are all focused on different sectors. So, for example, and I refer to the Appendix 3, Section 4, which outlines um, some of what other um, local authorities and places are doing. So, for example, in Liverpool, um, they're looking at how 5G might be able to um, enable them to deliver better adult and social care. Um, in Bristol, they're looking at smart tourism. So this is looking at um, how to bring to life um, the Roman baths um, through augmented reality. Uh, so very much a, a visitor experience. Um, in the West Midlands, they're looking at advanced manufacturing um, and they're looking at um, the connected ambulance use case I mentioned before. So we are looking at all of those use cases but for a couple of reasons, really. Firstly, we don't um, have all the answers here uh, as officers, so we're looking to learn, um, but we also don't want to risk duplication either. Um, so it's in our interest really to look and learn to see what other, other places are doing. Um, and I'll defer to my colleague Adrian um, on the 5G specifics on the Lansdowne. Yeah, so so what before we're doing you land. do, could I just ask a clarity, clarifying question, which is that we've, we were talking about the Lansdowne and 5G, which is 
what the council is doing, but there's other 5G going on as well, isn't there? So I know, I know that we can, we can focus on the Lansdowne, but yeah. there's lots more apart from the Lansdowne. Is, um, but I'm sure you may cover that. No, it's, it's, it's a really good point. Um, so there's, there's two things at play. So, um, I think it's EE and Vodafone have announced, uh, commercial deployments, uh, in, in, in the Bournemouth area. Um, and that will be at 3.5 gigahertz. Um, and then we have the opportunity uh, through Dorset LEP funding uh, to do some other work around sub-6 gigahertz and also at uh, 26 to 28 gigahertz as well. Um, but the, what we would be doing uh, as a local authority um, is, and this is a bit that we actually put into digital, uh, the Department for Digital Com- um, sorry, DCMS uh, two years ago, uh, is to just look at those technologies to see how we can actually apply them almost like in a local authority setting to see how we can determine the value and the benefits um, from different use cases, whether it be about autonomous buses, whether it be about social care, whether it be about policing or, or um, uh, ambulance services. So we're just doing a, a tiny pilot around the Lansdowne, which will probably be about three, probably antenna. This, and, and again, uh, we, we need to... So, so what we're doing uh, from from a BCP area, we're, we're planning around about two or three antenna uh, at 26 to 28 gigahertz, and probably about three or four antenna um, over a period of about two years to understand how what the value is from this new technology. It's actually not new technology. What from what this this technology, but in terms of new use cases. So, how can we actually work out what the social care value is, uh, and how can we work out, say, um, future transport? Um, opportunities are, which actually does help to tackle the climate change thing. So one of my background is in transport, and I know that 50% of the cost, let's say, of a bus is in the driver. If we could actually get autonomous buses running, then we could get far, far more cars off of the road. So there's a direct benefit there in terms of um, reducing uh, CO2 emissions. So these are things we want to begin to look at, uh, and, and, and we're obviously doing that in a very small pilot, and we'll end up hopefully working with the mobile network operators as well, so that we can actually do maybe in the future, bigger scale, um, exp- um, uh, bigger sc- the scale uh, s- studies, so we can actually work out what the benefits will be for for the public and uh, the wider people in the future. Thank you, thank you, Adrian. You, you, I think perhaps worth returning to what uh, we can do through uh, well, what the council can do um, with its deployment in Lansdowne when we come onto the health section, perhaps. But in terms of um, uh, the other non council 5g deployment what are the options there what 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 can we do if anything well this is actually and government have issued some guidance just very recently around what our responsibilities are as a local authority and they for third party um rollouts of 5g will actually be predominantly if not solely on the planning aspects um and uh and government have been quite clear about what that guidance is, and, and Simon Gould from the planning team can actually talk either through that now, if you would like, uh, to, to understand what the council's responsibilities are. Well, I think we'll be coming on to that in a minute. Was, so, um, Councillor Northover, was there any other points you wish to make? No. Uh, uh, Councillor Green. Yes, th- th- thank you, Chairman. Um, it, it, it's all a, a bit awkward. I suddenly find myself thinking, well, what would Councillor Mike Brooks be saying if he was listening to the conversation. Um, and I, I think it is important that we try to concentrate on what we as both OV and Scrutiny are looking to do with this because the decisions will go ahead, they will be cabinet decisions and so um, potentially to debate a number of the items that we are at the moment it isn't necessarily the role of our, our role here at this meeting, although those discussions will obviously take place a different, uh, a different time, possibly a different body. Um, but I, I am uh, the, the question that you have just asked about what can be done and what can't be done. And I understand that we'll talk about a lot more of that when we come down to the environmental and ecological concerns section afterwards, because I presume that's where the planning will will be discussed. Um, but there's been a request here and in other places to declare a moratorium, and I'm just picking up on what you were saying earlier, Chairman, about the. Um, of the third party providers and the telecoms providers um, and what they will be doing. Can I just ask, as a, from a general point of view, if the council were to choose to declare a moratorium, 
what effect would that actually have? Of course, the uh, the Lansdowne project, the 5G, obviously, it's within our control, and we wouldn't be, and, and a moratorium would mean we would not go ahead with anything in, in the Lansdowne. Um, but what is the effect on those outside the council control? Uh, that's a good question. Um, uh, Simon, Simon Gould. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, so from a planning point of view, Councillor Green, um, I, I feel like a good starting point in this, this discussion is obviously the national planning policy framework, which is NPPF as we lovingly know it. Um, paragraph 114 of the NPPF states that local planning authorities should not impose a ban on new electronic communications development in certain areas or impose blanket Article 4 directions over a wide area. That's a green. Chairman, if I might, that, that wasn't the question. I was, I was going to ask about that within, the, within that next section on planning. But my, my question was whether within government guidelines or outside government guidelines, whether through a recommendation of this board or through cabinet or through full council, if BCP council were to say, although it's against that, that one, we are going to declare a moratorium, what effect will that actually have? The implications of that would be that when planning applications come in, for the, for the installation of for upgrading existing masts or new masts, if we were to flatly refuse them because we've got this moratorium, we run a high risk of obviously losing appeals and award of costs against us. Okay. Um, uh, Councillor Green, happy. I'll come on to more in that section. No problem. Councillor Trent. Thank you, Chair. I have to admit that on. The whole 5G thing, I am very definitely a technophobe and I just think it's a gift to any ne'er-do-well who wants to cause mayhem because it puts a lot of everyday things under the control of people who can hack into the system and I think that is dangerous. There is, there is however, I think the need with this is, is, is to somehow get the figures and the science and the scare stories if that's what they are into context we're sitting in a room which is a hotbed of you know wi-fi connection where we're, we're being bombarded with electromagnetic stuff we actually live in homes that are being bombarded with electromagnetic signals um on christmas day there'll be kids playing with radio control cars they operate at quite a high frequency so more electromagnetic signals in a shopping center it's full of it and I would need to actually know and understand the level of exposure that we have maybe sitting in this room at this very moment and put it into context with any research that suggests what 5G would create. And um, it would be interesting actually to see whether there is any way of trying to get it in, in into context because I am wary of... Um, Conspiracy theories, conspiracy theories have put some very dangerous people into government in the last five years or so. But I do think that we need to get this right. We do need to look at this with with facts and with some background information so that we can make a proper judgment. Because I do, I do fear that um, we are being swayed by... Well, well, I'll give an example, actually. When um, 3G was was introduced, and I was part of a discussion on that, we introduced uh, various um, control mechanisms to stop the masks being placed near schools and things like that. But at, at the time, it was going to be a mast in every road to make it work properly. Um, my nearest mast is about half a mile away, and um, I get a poor but you know, usable signal. And again, you know, it's actually separating the what is scare story and what is fact. Thank you very much, um, Councillor Trent. I feel it might be appropriate to, to move on to the next section, which continues the, the theme of, of general concerns. Um, um, and then 
move on to maybe some of the ecological, environmental and particularly planning issues. Um, one of the things that, that struck me in the, um, uh, certainly generated the most response in this section was number 22, where people talked about the, the potential financial cost or drain on budgets to implement 5G, um, particularly, I suppose, in the context of why we're here, to the council. I wonder whether the officers may be able to give some insight into this. I mean, I suppose probably putting aside the the, 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 the Lansdowne project. In terms of the implementation, the wider implementation of, of 5G, um, what, I, mean, I suppose it was phrased in many of these as do we not have better things to spend our money on? Um, what financial cost is there to the council in particular of, of the wider spread introduction of 5G connectivity? Um, obviously, if it's a commercial rollout, there won't be any necessarily financial burden on, on the council. Um, and obviously, we want to, you know, if, if the view is that connectivity is good and that we need that for the local economy, then actually, um, you know, obviously, uh, the council would hopefully support that. Um, but it has no financial impact on um on, from a local uh, authority perspective. Um, it, the irony is that actually, um, in terms of the Lansdowne test bed, if you, do, do you want me to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, if you yeah. Probably, yeah. So, so, so the background to the Lansdowne test bed, you know, we're, we're doing this for a reason. So, so what happened here, we put a bid into the local enterprise partnership, recognizing the productivity deficit that exists within Dorset. And, um, and the case that we're making there is that, um, New technologies um, are affecting, uh, or, or the lack of technology is affecting productivity not only within Dorset but within the UK as a whole. And uh, there's an opportunity with the advanced manufacturing sector that exists across Dorset to actually make use of this new technology. So one of the reasons why government is particularly keen on the rollout of 5G technology is because of the financial impact it can have on the UK economy as a whole. And um, there is an opportunity if we're looking at... Um, in, like social care use cases or autonomous vehicles and that sort of thing, that actually with the advanced manufacturing sector that we have in Dorset, that, se that sector will never be at the forefront of building phones in the UK, but we could be at the forefront of building 5G-enabled machines that can actually help everyday life. And that is a massive opportunity that has opened up for the Dorset economy. And that is uh, the reason why the LEP has decided to support the work that we're doing at the Lansdowne as a first step to understanding not only what the social value of doing uh, 5G technology, but also what was the economic value um, for BCP and also for the wider Dorset area. Thank you. Councillor Barlett. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I think you just answered the point I was going to make in that, um, you know, the uh, LEP and the studies going on about productivity has shown that in our area, the biggest contribution we can make to improving our economy is to uh, move forward with this kind of technology in a whole range of areas where it will br bring huge advantages and improving our productivity. So th the point I was going to make, uh, and it's the counter to paragraph 22, is what is the cost to the area of not introducing it? Uh, and, and that is a, key, a really key point, actually. It's not what it costs to put it in. It's what we're losing by not doing it. Just to come back on that? Agreed. No, it was just to, to add on the point around productivity to just kind of um, put that in context in terms of quality of life. I think that's really important. So the Office of National Statistics um, uh, did, a, did some analysis that if productivity across the UK had grown in line with the current projections, um, then every individual could have been £5,000 better off in terms of the income that they would be generating per household. So when we talk about productivity, we talk about the benefits to the economy and to businesses, but I think it's also worth highlighting actually the impact on people's quality of life and individual circumstances as well. Thank you very much. Uh, we have drifted actually um, into the, the last area as well, which is socioeconomic benefits. So worth colleagues bearing that in mind when we're hearing all of this so that we don't necessarily duplicate later. Um, I have uh, Councillor Ayinga. Yeah, um, thank you, Chair. Um, I'd just like to just pick on the last couple of comments that have been made. Um, I think quite rightly we're saying, for instance, this part of the country, we've fallen back a little bit economically. It does worry me, though, uh, a few of the, the, the last two or three comments. I, I don't think that kind of makes the case, then, that um, because we've fallen back somewhat, we've arguably got some catching up to do that justifies 
risks being taken, yeah. undue risks being taken. Um, <clears throat> and kind of more's the point is that I'm, while I said I was warm about the, the need for connectivity without saying what the solution would be, um, that alone won't turn Dorset into a supercharged tiger economy. We're, we're, there's more wrong with our local economy and things that need to be improved than just fixing connectivity with gadgets, a, a lot more things. So con context, please, context on this. The, but the, paragraph 22, going back sorry, Chair, to the, the point you're trying to keep us to, is that typically when we started with the cost of the council, and I think you gave the cost, as in what is it to BCP council, um, sometimes a lot of other people suffer when the council moves a certain way and then various other organisations, whether they're other public sector organisations or private sector, whatever, are kind of, well, have no choice but to fall in line because they're suppliers to the council or they're customer organisations or they're something else. And has any work done, please, which is, uh, which if the council was to adopt this, kind of whatever that means, you know, if the council was to take, what, what then is the knock-on effect suddenly if I was a private sector organisation supplying the council? Um, I've suddenly got to adopt something now, suddenly out of I to remain a supplier to the council. Um, I'll say no more, and I'm not expecting precise figures, but has any quantification of that been done, please? We haven't done any detailed analysis, I mean, uh, on the impact upon suppliers to the council per se, but, um, but we know that through the Dorset Local Enterprise Partnership, they had a business forum that was uh, two years ago, and the businesses were asked, yeah, what were the three biggest things that affect local businesses and productivity? And the, the top thing was congestion. The second thing was skills. The third, third thing was connectivity. And, uh, and, and there's two things here from the economic perspective. One is around um, all businesses losing out because they don't have the connectivity that they need to, uh, to do the businesses effectively. But the other thing is, is the opportunity that's been lost by the manufacturers who can actually be manufacturing uh, equipment and things like that. Sorry, yeah, for my point of order, Chairman, sorry, you, with respect, you're not actually answering my question. Microphone. No, no. So, 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 use a microphone. Use a microphone, that's fine, well. so, thank you. So, so okay, to, to, yeah. so we haven't done that detailed analysis on individual businesses, on the individual contracts with the council, um, but if that was what you, your question appeared no, no, to... No, 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 sorry, can I try again? Please do, Councillor. Sorry, please, I'm not, I'm not trying to... Um, Tiny one in knots at all. It's just, I'm not asking for a detailed analysis of individual contracts with others. Just in general, what would be the knock on effect suddenly, cost wise, to the wider economy if BCP was to adopt 5G? There will most certainly be a conversion cost of some magnitude yeah. to the wider economy yeah. of taking this on. I'm not asking about the benefits. The benefits we'll talk about separately, and it's already been part of the, how to work the cost, financial cost. If I was a big supplier to the council, what kind of Uplift. Cost uplift, am I looking at, please? One of the things that we're looking to do over the next six to nine months is to do um, an economic, uh, a full economic analysis of what the implications would be of better connectivity and making the case for that investment. So, unfortunately, I can't give an answer today, but, that, but we recognise there's enough going out of the local economy in terms of value, whether that be through... Um, uh, lack of productivity or, or other benefits to, to understand that we need to do a study and that study will be completed in the next six to nine months. Thank you. Um, Councillor Farquhar. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, I must say how much I enjoy being on the ONS board because this um, sort of questioning um, certainly stimulates the brain matter. Um, and it's always important always to come in help. With, a, uh, with, a, with a clear sort of perspective. Um, and my question essentially is based around some alarm. Um, the first one is not a question, but my alarm at uh, Mr. Simon Gould's uh, reply to the MPPF. The MPPF, the National Policy Planning, whatever it is, stands for, is whereby national policy overrides local concerns. Now, in your opening brief, Chair, you said that there was a number of things. On the ONS board, we look at risk. There's a number of options to come out of this, which is to make a recommendation to Cabinet and to our places in the, um, in the Council itself. One of the things which you didn't mention was a moratorium at that point. Um, the moratorium looks like it's no longer an opportunity for us, in theory, because the NPPF will override it. 
and the council then is at risk to incur expensive uh, uh, appeals for court costs against third party companies to actually do what they wish to do within our conurbation, even though we have a moratorium. That was my understanding of what Mr Simon Gould had to say. I, my concern and why I'm alarmed at that is because we were at a national policy on fracking. And fracking has since been found to be harmful in the north of, uh, north of, the, of the country, and it's been banned, and it's been overturned because the effects are measurable. But my question is this. My question is that a lot of terminology of test bed, test bed, test bed, you know, testing areas. My, qu my question is this, that when I wasn't here at the, the opening um, fact-finding to actually uh, the listening stage, one of my colleagues attended and asked a question as regards the Geneva Convention, as regards using people for testing against their permission. So my question is this. In these test beds, was the public consulted fully and were they invited to be part of that testing in these in these other cities, etc., that you talk about? So that's my question as regards test beds. Thank you. It's a difficult one to answer on behalf of other councils, but any information you can um, uh, uh, provide to this would be helpful. Thank you. I suppose that's the role of overview and scrutiny here, is that at the moment... Um, there's a cabinet paper that will be going to talk about um, the Lansdowne project in a month or so's time, and, uh, and that will take account of what a review and scrutiny has to say. Um, for me, actually, this whole process has been very good. It's been very open, very transparent, and it has been open to everybody to comment. And it's those comments that we will then take on board as part of, you know, going forward uh, with, with the Lansdowne pilot scheme. Does that answer the question? That, so no, no, this, I, this, I, this, I think process. it is a valid point. I think Councillor Farquhar alluded to what we can do as a board. And as we said right at the beginning, we are not a decision-making board. We can make recommendations. We can make our views very plain and known. Um, um, but equally, the, you know, we only really get utility if we contribute to the discussion positively and, uh, and try and influence further decision-making, which I think is a, a well-made point. Councillor Green. Thank, thank you, Chairman. Um, Councillor Trent earlier was speaking about the potential for security risk if, um, uh, with, with 5G. Um, is there any more security risk with a 5G network that's been identified as opposed to 1, 2, 3 or 4G or Tetra or whatever? Um, is, it, is, is there anything specific? Thank you, Councillor Green. Adrian. Sorry, I should have said because it is one of the questions that came up. Or one of the it was, in the, it was in the bundle of evidence. It was thank a you. concern that had been Thanks. raised. Um, Adrian. Oh, Ruth, thank you. Um, so one of the work streams that we're going to be looking at is absolutely the security element of 5G. Um, we have a local body called the Dorset Cyber Alliance, which is a, a group of um, public sector, um, Dorset Police, uh, Bournemouth University, Cyber Security Lab um, and BCP Council. Um, and the idea behind that is to actually generally make this area as digitally secure as possible. I think it recognises the risks that small to medium size enterprises face around um, cyber security attacks. What we're in discussions with them at the moment is whether that programme could develop a work stream that would um, essentially look at this exact scenario. Councillor Green. Sorry. Uh, thank, thank you very much for, uh, for that, Ruth. But I mean, obviously that's just looking within BCP. Um, and I thought the, the, the 5G project internationally is obviously far, far advanced to where we are. So I'm, I'm really looking for if there's any evidence um, from around the world over the last few, days, few years that 5G makes things any, either any more vulnerable or less vulnerable or basically the same as it was uh, in, in any other technology or any other. I think the thing is, is it's, it's all around data. So we're talking about 5G as though it's an isolated technology. It's not. This applies to all technologies. And it's all about data. And we know that like data is growing exponentially. So as data grows exponentially, so the risks obviously to cyber attack uh, grows significantly. Um, and I suppose to some extent in the UK, that's down to the National Cyber Security Centre uh, to advise on how we uh, protect um, you know, critical infrastructure and personal data as well. 
well, and we are taking advice from them. Um, and uh, so, yes, the, the answer will be uh, any uh, network that enables more data to transfer across it will increase the risk. Um, but, you know, it is, in going back to points that have been raised earlier about risk, it's always about balanced risk. There's, you know, there can be risks with different things and, and therefore do the risks outside, the, uh, outweigh the benefits. And, and, and this is where it, 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 you know, we need to think about that. I absolutely agree. Sorry, sorry for my, my chairman, that, that's not quite what I'm getting at. I, I think we all understand that if there's more data being, flowing around, then there will be more risk of hacking. And that's, that's true whichever way, whichever route you go. So just to try and get things, sort of looking at things, comparing apples and apples, my, I guess my question is, if you had the same amount of data flowing because you had 4G masts every, you know, every foot or whatever, or 5G masts that were, were doing what they're doing, but you still had the same amount of data, does one part of the technology have more inherent risk than the other or... or, or more, less, or the same, or just don't know yet? Intuitively, no, but, but others might take a different view. I don't think, in, in many respects, yeah, I mean, we'd have to take advice on that, but I don't believe there would be. Thank you very much. Actually, so a, a valid point to raise, and particularly with the work that we are actually quite good at, I think, locally on cyber security, certainly at trying to lead. It might be something that this panel can get more, inf- this board can get more involved with in the future in terms of um, uh, liaising on, on pieces of work on, on that basis, particularly as things like potentially 5G take off. And as, as you mentioned, the more digital we become, the more uh, opportunities, but risks there are as well. Uh, and that, that is a very real concern. Um, I'm very conscious of time we have about an hour left um, and uh, we have some of the, the the big issues to go through to get uh, uh, to get to so uh, with the board's permission I was going to lump uh, the environmental and ecological concerns in with the health concerns and move uh, directly onto that area now I think perhaps probably better that we start with the the, the planning side of things because uh, we've got uh, mr. Gould with us and we've touched upon some of those areas so I don't know whether you, there's I mean you've obviously um, given us a little bit of background as to uh, the planning implications of five is there anything more you wish to add before we probe a little deeper into that, Simon? Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Um, <clears throat> so, obviously from a planning point of view, um, I have mentioned the NPPF earlier, which is obviously the central government's national planning policy document. Obviously that feeds down through to local planning authorities who in turn produce their own development plans. Um, I mentioned the NPPF, the rhetoric coming from the NPPF, which is, uh, there's a chapter, chapter 10, which is supporting high quality communications. And it, it covers just over a page of A4. So it, it's fairly brief in that respect. Um, but that's not inconsistent with the NPPF on a lot of topics. Um, but the, the, the rhetoric is very positive. It, 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 you know, and to quote from certain sort of paragraphs, it says that, um, you know, planning policies and decisions should support the expansion of electronic communication networks. Um, it does go on to say that we need to keep them in check and that the number of, and the ratio of electronic communication masks, they should be kept to a minimum. Um, but equally, obviously, we need to take on board the operator's requirements in terms of being able to roll out the network. Um, they, they do encourage the use of existing masks over new masks. Um, and that same applies to using masks that are on buildings or on the ground or other structures. Um, I've mentioned, obviously, the, the rhetoric around that we should not impose bans on new electronic communications. We should not impose blanket Article 4 directions, um, and include over wide areas or a wide range of electronic communication development. And we shouldn't impose minimum distances between new electronic communications. So again, you can pick up the vibe that the rhetoric is very positive in, in that regard. Um, it does place an onus on an applicant, and, and it's important to understand here that I sit alongside colleagues here from the planning department. They work in a different sector, so um, I'm looking at not just what the ambitions of BCP Council might be in terms of rolling out stuff in the Lansdowne or in other parts of the new conurbation or the new area. Um, you know, we're looking at also planning applications that will be received from network operators, such as Vodafone or EE, for example. So um, we do require a level of information from applicants when they submit um, planning applications to us. Um, and we do require them to justify 
those proposed developments. Um, paragraph 115 of the NPPF says that um, applicants should have consultations with organisations that have an interest in a proposed development, um, in particular the relevant body where a is to be installed near a school or a college or within a statutory safeguarding zone surrounding an aerodrome. Then there's also talk about technical sites or military exposure storage areas. But, um, they also say that for an existing mast or base station, um, a statement that self-certifies, that's quite important, that self-certifies that the cumulative exposure when operational will not exceed ICNRP, which, are, if for those people understand it, that's the, the, um, the, the public health, um, um, the, the sort of health side of um, telecoms. Um, and the same for new masks, again, um, that we should look to explore possibilities for erecting antenna on existing buildings, masks or other structures. Um, and again, requiring them to self-certify that they comply with the ICNA guidelines. The, the crucial part, I think, Chairman, is paragraph 116, where it says that local planning authorities must determine applications on planning grounds only. Um, we should not seek to prevent competition between different operators, question the need for an electronic communication system, or set health safeguards different from the International Commission guidelines. And so with that in mind, Chairman, uh, when it comes to the planning side of, of considering proposals for new masks or swapping out existing masks, um, we're quite limited on what we can consider. And invariably that comes down to the sighting and appearance of masks and I'd refer you to page 16 in Appendix 3 of the report that you've got, where at, at Section 9, there's a commentary that sets out, summarises what I've just run through, but on the last page, on page 17, it sets out the types of considerations that you would have in respect to sighting and appearance. And so, um, it might be contentious to say it, but the public health concerns, so from a planning point of view, if a proposal meets the ICNA guidelines, then it's not really the remit of planning to take a view, account of you to that. And that's a deliberate move by central government to take that public health side away from the planning system. Um, yes, um, turning, sorry, if we could just... Yeah, thank you very much. Sorry, no, carry on. Oh, I'm just sorry, trying to if we could keep the background um, noise to a minimum. To just, just give you a further flavour, there's a number of types of applications that we could receive... Um, for the, the erection or the installation of, of masks. Um, we could have a full planning application where we would have the normal range of considerations around impact on character of the area, the amenity, um, so on. But we also have a permitted development regime. So central government is essentially saying there that permission is granted, but they will require an applicant to seek the prior approval of the local planning authority. And again, that limits the scope of considerations to siting and appearance. There's a further layer, which is permitted development, where the requirement is only to notify the local planning authority. So in those instances, all the requirement is, is for an operator is to notify us in writing that they intend to do something. They can then go ahead and do that. And just briefly, um, Chairman, um, as I know you've just mentioned time, um, in the, uh, I presume the members have seen the letter from um, the Department for Digital Culture, Media and Sport dated November 2019. Paragraph 3 is quite a nice summation. But it does reference um, at the end of paragraph 2 that there is been a recent government publication, a consultation on the principle of proposed reforms to permitted development. And this is this document here. Um, and I won't, I won't go into the detail, Chairman, but very briefly, again, the thrust of this well, is the, the, to support the deployment of 5G. And what it talks about is looking at various options of relaxing um, guidelines, sorry, permitted development rules to enable more things to go ahead with less control from the local planning authority. So, in effect, relaxing permitted development rights to, in some instances, take away the need to apply for prior approval. So, again, there's a, there's a, there's a, a thrust of, of, um, <coughs> from central government about the, their sort of general support for... Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Simon, for that 
um, very good summary. Um, I've covered a number of speakers on this issue, but if I may start, I think one of the things that, that concerns me is that, I mean, you can, you can see from government's point of view that the direction is very clear to try and make it as easy as possible for this technology to be rolled out and essentially for planning not to get in the way. Um, but essentially this is the, the, the very, certainly the first that I've heard about all of this. Um, and I think there is a, a genuine concern with, you know, 220 responses and, you know, people in this room um, that the concerns of local people, uh, it is diminishing the ability for local people to, to raise concerns, particularly if they're essentially not allowed to through the planning process. So... <laughs> Having said that, you've touched on a number of the different types of planning that will go. What's your, I mean, it's very new, but um, what's your feeling on, on terms of, in terms of moving forward, how involved um, public consultation will be um, in the, the rollout of, of new masks, for instance? Where, where, where an applicant is still required to submit an application, whether it's a full planning application or a prior approval application, there is still a public consultation period as part of that application. So in the same way that you see the yellow site notices around, around the locality. Um, so we would still have a period of public notification in, in the lifetime of those applications that require prior approval or the full. Obviously, then um, third parties would have the right to comment. Members would have the right to obviously get involved, um, potentially call it in. So there is still very much that democratic process. Um, the, the, the consultation paper that central government has issued um, um, you know, in uh, sorry, November of this year looks at, and it, it hasn't come into force yet, but it's looking at relaxing some of the permitted development rights to make more things permitted development where you don't require prior approval. So in that respect, if that did come to fruition, then there would be less scope for public comment. Thank you very much. Perhaps something to uh, consider further. Councillor Green. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, as you're taking health concerns and uh, planning together, I hope it's OK. Actually, the two are quite, uh, are quite related. If I ask one question and then the other. Um, and the first is, is, is regarding health concerns, because I was very much involved personally about 15 years ago when we were having, although in a different borough, um, the debate over... 2G masks and 3, 3G masks and uh, sort of sitting exactly where the people behind, behind you are. Um, and we were arguing at that point about the potential health risks and um, in my role as a planning board member in the other authority, then also turning down um, uh, some of the, the applications. Um, said, I do feel on, on that one that maybe we had a bit of, got a bit of egg on my face because having predicted that there were going to be cancer clusters, etc., that they didn't turn out in the case of 2G, and, and particularly Tetra. Um, and in Tetra, which is the, the police uh, and the emergency services um, communication, our concern then particularly was that it was very low frequency and similar to, a, a, similar to brainwave frequency. Um, here we're talking about something which is a much higher frequency than we've had elsewhere in, in the other uh, parts of technology. And so what I, I, I understand how it is low energy, because, but all of these are low energy, whether it's 1G, 2G, 3G, 4G, Tetra or 5G, they're all low energy. The frequency changing. Is there any um, evidence either way, and I mean, do mean any, any evidence at all, that the high frequency um, that we're talking about here with, with, with 5G poses a greater greater threat to health than the others which we were objecting to 15 years ago. That's my, my first question on that. Thank you very much. I wonder if uh, we could bring uh, Sam into the equation here, who's the Director of Public Health for Dorset. Um, thank you, Sam. Thank you, Chair. So, as I explained in the first session, which was the call for evidence, um, we are guided by Public Health England advice on this, and Public Health England take their recommendations based on the current guidelines, which are produced by this body called ICNERP, which was referred to in the previous question. So the International Committee for Non-Ionising Radiological Protection are the body that set what are called safe exposure limits. Now, the current guidelines go up to uh, exposure limits up to 300 gigahertz, 
And my understanding is that the types of exposures that are likely to be received from the current deployment that we're talking about in the Lansdowne testbed are in the order of a couple of tens of gigahertz. So as Director of Public Health, I would be saying that as long as there is no evidence at all that any of those deployments exceed the current recommended safety limits, there shouldn't be any cause for concern. Right, thank you. So, so what you're saying is at the moment there is no... Um, no evidence suggests that a high frequency, higher than uh, than in one to one to four G, is going to cause any problem. Has there been research done on the high level, high frequency? So there has been research in this area for decades because there are lots of other devices that produce electromagnetic <coughs> fields at much much higher frequencies. And those studies are the basis on which ICNERP set their exposure levels. So it's not just about 5G. It's about a much broader range of devices that give off EMF fields. Um, So as far as I'm aware, as long as the guidelines aren't exceeded, there shouldn't be any cause for concern around harms to human health. Thank you, Chairman. The the, the planning side of the the question, um, and I'm sort of going back into into memory, we, we... we turned a number of uh, foam mast applications down on the grounds of uh, health risk, and in each and every time we were overturned by uh, those decisions were overturned by uh, National Planning Inspectorate on appeal. But if I remember rightly, there was a case, I, I think it might have been Tamworth or somewhere like that, or Tandridge, which, um, where they didn't turn it down on the grounds of health risks. Um, because those were always getting overturned, but they successfully turned one down because of fear of health risk, because that was a, a could, could be quantified. People were afraid of the health risks, and therefore it was ad- adversely impacting on them. Is that something that's been looked at here as a potential for local authorities to be able to successfully turn down applications for 5G masks? Um, I'm not aware of the specific case that you refer to because clearly obviously it's outside of uh, our jurisdiction Um, I've I've never known if that I say I can't comment on on, on the particulars of that case so it's a quite challenging question in one sense Um, but I'm I'm not aware I mean the reality in planning is that you know when something goes to an appeal um, we, we, you know, it's an, it, it's an inspector's view on, on something, isn't it? Um, so that may have been an anomaly in amongst many other decisions. I, I can't comment on that particular case because I'm not aware of it. Um, there is this thing in planning about the perception of something. We could talk about the perception of overlooking or we could talk about, you know, to bring it back to this. But um, I'd, I'd, lo- I'd, I'd like to read that particular case to understand what led the inspector to conclude that that, that, that perception was so great that it warranted refusal. Because I, I would imagine, um, with the rhetoric that central government is rolling out through national planning policy framework, um, that uh, more cases than not, an inspector would normally um, allow the appeal subject to other considerations around sighting and appearance. So it's, it's a difficult question without knowing the particulars. Thank you. Thank you. If I could just ask that, uh, it, might, it might have been Tandridge or something. It's just in, in my mind it's Tandridge or Tamworth or something like that, and it would have been about 2003, 2004. But if we could just ask that the officers do some digging with, uh, with that, that would be very helpful. Thank you. Thank you very much. And before we start to uh, inevitably drift away from the planning, um, I just wanted to um, uh, to raise a point, kind of an express a, a concern that I, I raised a little bit of time ago in, in the engagement of the public in planning going forward uh, and maybe suggest to the board that this might be something that we wish to refer to Cabinet. I mean, there are two things, aren't there? there there's a statutory planning functions and what essentially what the law is, the law is. Um, and obviously, if there are uh, systems in place that we have to follow, we have to follow. It doesn't stop us going above and beyond, though, does it? So, for instance, just because 
um, there's going to be limited consultation on uh, by by law uh, on the sites of new mosques, for instance. It doesn't mean that as a council we can't explore further whether we we have a duty as a council to be uh, involving the public more or certainly letting the public know more about that. So perhaps this is something. I mean, I've just drafted a uh, a, a recommendation that we may wish to make to cabinet that recommends that cabinet considers ways to involve the public more in the consultation around the planning implication of the implementation of. 5G, particularly around the masts. Uh, before, I wonder, Simon, you aim to comment? Yeah, no, that's, that's a very good point, Jim. And, and, and obviously, you know, with the advent of BCP Council, um, you know, we will obviously be moving forward over the next sort of two, three, four years towards, from a planning point of view, the production of a new development plan that covers the whole of the conurbation, whereas at the moment, obviously, we've got our own individual local plans. So that plan-making process is, is obviously heavily, um, there's a lot of consultation around that, public involvement. So there may be a vehicle there for, um, you know, for, for to, well, it's, it's a fully engaged process anyway, but that might be one vehicle that you could consider you know, um, you know, sort of shaping that public involvement. Thank you very much. In which case, I'll I'll, I'll make that as a, a formal recommendation. I wonder whether um, I'm not going nuts and I may seek a seconder. Councillor Nicola Green. Thank you, Chairman. I'd be very happy to um, second that subject to the addition of the words that there is genuine equity for all residents across the, con the conurbation. We have been around this before um, in an issue of um, site notifications and the way in which people are um, informed. And I think if we are to make um, any genuine progress in providing our residents with assurance um, that um, their voices will be heard in the planning application, Every resident of BCP should expect to be notified of such an application in the same way. That, that point taken on board and actually yeah, does join to uh, discussions that we've previously had. So to, to reiterate that the recommendation is that Cabinet considers the way to involve the public more in an equitable way uh, in the consultation around the planning implications of the implementation of 5G, uh, in particular with regards to the sites of the masts. Um, any further uh, comments or discussions on that? Uh, Councillor Farquhar and then Councillor Trent. Thank you, Chair. Can I um, move a, uh, uh, an amendment, or oh, sorry, a, a, an addition um, to um, that recommendation that we as an authority, we reach out to those authorities that have already called a moratorium and we consult with them as regards the costs which may or may not have been awarded under the MPPF um, that has been awarded against those authorities. If you wish to... I'm getting advice from others. I think we are conflating two slightly different issues here. I think one is to do with the uh, involvement of the public more in the planning process and the implementation uh, as opposed to uh, the moratorium. So perhaps we come back to that um, item separately later. Councillor Trent. Yes, Chairman, there was... One, one, one thing, and it's possibly a couple of calls ago now, but it was about the planning aspect. And um, like Councillor Green, I sat round a um, table back in you know, probably 15, 20 years ago talking about the introduction of 3G and precautions. And one of the precautions that was introduced... And we've heard about um, not not being able to set minimum distances um, you know, between masks and so on. One of the things that was set at the time was that it, um, a mask shouldn't be within a certain distance of a school or a nursery or somewhere where children are. And um, I must admit that it kind of stuck in the throw it a little bit when a few years later sort of every child that we were seeking to protect was going around with a phone glued to their ear but it was it it was something that was built into the local plan and it did it did survive I think um challenges and I'm sort of wondering whether that is something that could be built in because if there is a a, a case for a precautionary principle somewhere, it's with regards to children because they have the most time to, you know, develop problems relating from the... 
Thank you, Councillor Trent. If I may make a, a, a respectful suggestion, which is that all recommendations that the board makes, um, I, I take personally on behalf of the board as chair to the cabinet, and that will be um, a kind of an extra part of this, a, a, a general flavour behind the scenes that I'm quite happy to, to take forward. But, but um, actually, need, need the answer. Would we be able to um, have a very specific um, thing like that? Would that be something we could do, having heard the um, sure. yeah, guidance. Absolutely take that point on board. Um, and again, this perhaps needs more research, but actually um, one of the issues is actually around phone mass, is actually the closer to the phone mass you are, the less energy you actually use. So in some respects, um, you know, we need to look at the science around that request because actually um, if, if the masks are fairly close to the school, it means actually the phones are actually giving off less energy because they get a better signal. It's as your phone moves away from the antenna, you see the bars on your phone. And this, if you've got fewer bars, that's actually when your phone is taking the greatest energy. So actually there's a per the perverse thing about this is actually the closer you are to an antenna, the less energy your phone is taking. Okay. So it's just something to bear in mind yeah. in that recommendation. Thank you for that explanation, Adrian. So we have a uh, recommendation on a table which has been uh, proposed and seconded. Is this about the recommendation, Councillor Langer? If we could deal with the recommendation first, I think. Uh, Councillor Barton. Thank you. It, it does relate to the, uh, to the move, but I, I, actually the point I was going to raise uh, was that... Um, you know, the public involvement in the planning process is inherent within the process as it is. The local plan is currently being worked up, so any issues surrounding this technology will naturally find its way through the public consultation process and into the local plan. It will certainly find itself into any planning application that becomes before the board. But the issue I had is one of the... Um, uh, of the uh, permitted development rights, and we've heard the various classes of permitted development rights. It may well be, as for example, with a gas installation, which when they were first installed, frightened the public to death because there were lots of <laughs> explosions in London and lots of people were killed, but progressively it's got to the point where nobody bats an eyelid about a new gas installation in the street, and it's done under the... The, the, the notification process it's just a notification for the council and it, without understanding what will and will not be in the um, permitted development uh, for uh, this kind of technology it's difficult to say but you know one assumes that unless there was a, a safety issue or some a bigger issue or the location of a mask or whatever if there, if there are no issues about that then the, the, uh, the service companies will be providing notifications only under permitted development rights, you know, and, and uh, that, that is quite a big issue because it means no matter what we're talking about here, the government have taken responsibility for the technology through the laws that they've laid down within the MPPF. And therefore, it doesn't matter what we say, that's what the government is saying. They've already made an assessment of that. It's in the planning system already, actually. So I'm not sure, I mean, you know, by all means, invite the public to comment on it. Thank you. But, but if I may, that is the spirit of the recommendation, actually, about doing further public consultation precisely to address those points. Um, so in the spirit of um, trying to, to move on, we have a, a, a proposal of recommendation in front. Um, can I get the board's um, uh, views, all, the, all of those that are in favour? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. All those that are against? None. And an abstentions? One. One. Thank you very much. It gives us something to, to take forward positively to Cabinet. Um, if I may now, if we, if we try and um, move a little bit further into the, uh, the, the health implications side, I'm very conscious that we've got the uh, expertise of Sam with us, and actually we had asked at the initial call for evidence um, that, um, albeit not in an exhaustive way, but um, uh, you know, uh, Sam very kindly offered to look over some of the evidence that was pre presented uh, to see whether there was anything in there in particular that jumped out but also I wonder whether you want to give us a, a, a bit of a flavour on, on, on where public health and public health England will sit on this issue. Thank you, Sal. Thank you, Chairman. So mindful of time, uh, I don't want to cover off too much of the ground that we covered in the first inquiry when we, in, as part of the call for evidence. I just want to talk a little bit about the way that Public Health England is handling this issue nationally. 
Uh, you may be aware from the last time that we met uh, during the call for evidence there was some discussion of the updating of the ICNIRP guidelines. Um, they, they were due to be updated in the autumn as of yet, and I did check yesterday. They haven't been released, although the consultation is now closed. So at some point there will be a new set of guidelines uh, coming from ICNRP. So Public Health England position is that they continue to update their view based on those evidence reviews and those evidence summaries as they become available. The, um, I have been in contact with the Centre for Radiation, Environment and Chemicals, CRCE, which is the body within Public Health England that's responsible for assessing environmental hazards. And their senior scientist in the EMF team has agreed that they would be very happy to look at any of the evidence that's been submitted as part of the review. But they do have some conditions and caveats around that. So what they've explained is that they wouldn't be able to provide a separate commentary on specific individual pieces of evidence. But if there are any studies that they've overlooked that we feel are important scientifically, they're more than happy to take those into account and they will make sure that they're considered as part of the next round of reviews. So that's the commitment that we've had back from Public Health England. Um, I have a, another, a colleague, a consultant of Public Health, who's also a GP, who's going through the inbox and we're reviewing every single piece of that information uh, in depth and anything that jumps out we will forward on to, to Public Health England. I have to say that on an initial sifting, a lot of that evidence appears to be uh, quite opinion-based and, and wouldn't fall into the type of category that PHE would consider. Thank you. If we could, if we could let Sam have his um, say. Thank you. So when I, when I last uh, talked to this committee, I said that I wasn't an expert in 5G or electromagnetic field exposure, and, I, and I'm not. Um, but what I do have expertise in is the way that we assess uh, scientific evidence, the way that we assess studies that look at assessing uh, the issues between exposures to particular hazards in the environment and whether or not that's likely statistically to lead to an effect. That's only the first stage. The second stage is then to make an assessment as to whether there's a, there's a cause and effect. In some of the, a lot of those studies are observational, so you're observing what's happened to populations and you're trying to measure those exposures. That doesn't necessarily mean that even when you see an association in a study, that that is a causal association. So that's my expertise, and that's my team's expertise. And to do that, we're guided by frameworks. Uh, those frameworks of evidence tend to look for um, methodological uh, quality in the studies that we look at, and the highest tier of those studies are called systematic reviews. So those are reviews that are undertaken by multidisciplinary teams, usually panels that are made up of lots and lots of different experts. And the reviewers spend a lot of time formulating the question quite carefully. And the way that the review is carried out is very carefully determined to try to reduce the risk of bias. There's all sorts of biases that can creep in. Um, one of the biggest biases is publication bias. So if you look through the published scientific evidence, sometimes you will see a bias in favour of studies that may see uh, a particular effect, and studies that don't find an effect sometimes don't get published. So it's just to try to underline that carrying out these reviews is painstaking work. It takes a lot of time and effort and energy. Uh, we would not propose to replicate that locally, and that's why we work very closely with PHE, WHO, and we rely on those international panels for that, for that advice. Um, thank you very much um, for that introduction, Sam. Also, I think it's um, it, it's beneficial to hear that, that Public Health England do accept that, I suppose, as the saying goes, you don't know what you don't know. Um, do you think it would be helpful? I mean, we, you've had a commitment from Public Health England to, to take on board some of the evidence that we've collated. Um, would it be helpful for the board to, to formalise that, to, to say that essentially as a board we give permit, I suppose it would be useful for us to give permission for that, that um, those evidence that we have collated to be to be forwarded on. Uh, Councillor Nicola Green. Thank you, Chairman. The question that I was going to ask is not dissimilar from yours, and it's really asking Sam about the potential for feedback, because what you said is that um, Public Health England are taking on um, any of the, uh, the concerns which have not been covered elsewhere, and that one of your colleagues in, I presume, in Public Health, is that in Public Health Dorset? Is there still the Pan Dorset Public Health Board um, and what I do know is that there will be a cabinet um, portfolio holder for public health. Um, and when this 
board essentially hands our piece of work over whether there is some way that we can make a recommendation that that feedback loop is closed into cabinet by the re any report any outcome going back through that portfolio holder Perhaps, if I may, that is a recommendation of two parts that we could make. First of all, that the evidence that we've collated today is passed through to Public Health England. And secondly, that a, uh, a framework is established for the, uh, the feedback from that evidence to come back in, to the council in some form. Um, is, is that a recommendation that you'd like to make? That's exactly a recommendation. Right, thank you. Um, Councillor Haynes? Thank you, Chair. I'm happy to second the uh, proposal from Councillor Nicola Green. Um, and if I could just say something very quickly, because it's also related to the proposal from Councillor Nicola Green, which is, I think, Sam, you mentioned that there is going to be another review. And do you have any idea what the time frame would be for this review that um, the next round of reviews regarding health concerns that have been raised, of which, you know, we've seen quite a, a number being raised in this forum here. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Sam. Just to, to clarify a couple of those points, if I could, if I could just clarify the request for uh, feedback, first of all, uh, more than happy to come back to report to Cabinet and to the portfolio holder what we've passed on to Public Health England. I... Um, I, I can't promise what sort of a response they will give because the email that I've had back from the centre says that they will acknowledge receipt of the studies, but it depends on the time frame for incorporating them in future reviews. So we might not get a timely reply back as to the, the quality and the implications of, of that evidence. Does that, does that make sense? I think that makes sense. Although one hopes that the very act of formalising it from the board may, may add, give it some extra clout, so to speak. So we have a recommendation um, uh, from the board, from uh, Councillor Green, to, um, to request that the information is passed over, uh, the evidence that we've uh, collated is passed over to Public Health in England, and also for a mechanism to be um, in place for that, the, the feedback from that to, to make its way back to the council in some form. Any uh, extra debate on that particular? Particular recommendation, or are we all happy to, if we happy to take it to the vote? All those in favour? That's unanimous. Thank you very much. Um, I'll move on to the next speaker, Councillor Farquhar. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Um, going back to something which you said, uh, Adrian, um, as regards. Uh, 5G masks or any telecommunication masks being in close proximity schools. And you said that um, the peculiar thing is that the closer to the device, the less um, energy that device uses. Now, earlier um, when you were presenting, and it's a shame that your technological expert is not here, but the pressing question which I have, I spoke to a telecommunications engineer um, outside of this place, and I was led to believe when we talk about density, that as more devices can get onto the 5G network, is that that knowledge from that particular individual was that the more devices that actually try to use it or demand of it, and we are talking about devices now that your refrigerator or your toaster, and just on the question of cyber security, just as an aside, I did attend a cyber security mandatory training as part of being a councillor last week and some of our cyber breaches in not this organisation but very other large organisations have come about by a microwave being the port of entry into the wider network but the question which I have is that the nature of the mechanics of the way that the 5G network works is that the more the demand the stronger the signal that has to be put out is that the case? Because I accept the point which you're saying that if you have one device and you're next to the antenna, yeah, no problem, you get a good signal. If, however, you had 5,000 children in that same playground, what actually happens to that transmitter? What strength of signal does it push out? Sorry, I apologise that Ryan's had to go. I mean, he would be the best person to, to answer that question. I'm not qualified to answer that question, so... Um, I'd have to refer it to, to him. 
it might be worth um, referring back to the ICNAP guidelines, which talk about the cumulative effect of lots of different devices. Um, I don't know this. I don't know the specifics, but it talks about the cumulative effect of the density of devices as expected. So the um, levels that um, Sam was talking about earlier um, that would have taken into consideration a cumulative effect. Mr. Crabb. Chair, I mean, I do have, a, uh, I do have a, a summary from Public Health England that I could share to panel members if that's helpful, where they, they address this point. Um, from memory, Public Health England said that they, it, it is true that the overall exposure would increase with 5G deployment, but as far as they're aware, they would not be anywhere near the type of uh, exposure levels that are currently covered by the ICNEP guidelines, so it would be way, way, way below that 300 gigahertz threshold. So I'd be quite happy to share that with panel members if that's helpful. That would be, that would be very welcome. Uh, uh, another, another point from me, actually. I'm feeling in a, a recommendy point of mood. mood. Um, just to go back to what we were discussing earlier on around Lansdowne, um, because it, it strikes me, and we've heard from a planning point of view and the, the, certainly the thrust from government uh, and the, the limited options, perhaps, that we have with regards to uh, the private industry's deployment uh, of 5G. I suppose we have um, uh, planning um, uh, tools in our arsenal, perhaps, although they are uh, uh, fairly limited by the sounds of it. Um, but also it does seem to be um, accepted, particularly with the recommendations and the analysis by Public Health England as well, um, that so long as the, the limits are not breached, it's, it's it's one of those things that, you know, will, will carry on. However, we are, are we not in a unique position with the potential Lansdowne project in that this is actually a council initiative? Therefore, perhaps we have more of an element of control than we might do, and perhaps any other councils do, um, of, of taking a more direct um, part in this process. So the, the thinking um, I have is that if Cabinet are minded to approve uh, the deployment by the Council of 5G within Lansdowne, which I believe is coming to Cabinet early next year, um, it is, would, what would the Board's view on us asking that Cabinet ensure that testing is undertaken to ensure that with the, the, the element that we have control over, that the outputs fall within the internationally recognised limits? Councillor Green. Thank you, thank you, Chairman. I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that testing will be taking place anyway. So I think really what we're asking for is that Cabinet should monitor um, the, uh, the levels to ensure that they stay beneath the recommended um, thresholds. Would that be okay, Chair? I think, I think that makes sense. So if I was to, to, to summarise that, that if Cabinet approved the deployment by the Council... Uh, of 5G within Lansdowne that um, continuous monitoring takes place uh, to ensure that the output falls within the internationally recognised limits. I think that seems to be a positive uh, suggestion of an area that we actually have some control over. Uh, Adrian, would you wish to comment? We welcome that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, comments from members of the board? Anybody wish to second? Okay, Councillor Haynes. Happy second, Chair, but if we could also, sorry, I, I probably wasn't listening properly, that um, we would seek feedback from the monitoring. Thank you. And report back to the Overview and Scrutiny Board at the end of that, that recommendation. So if you're happy to second um, comments, Councillor Ainger. Sorry, Chair, with respect, I've no doubt it will pass the test. Um, it's, it's, what... I'm in a strange position of, I, li I like the spirit of the recommendation, absolutely, and if that's what the wording of it is, I'll be voting in favour of it for that recommendation. It's, it's, uh, like with that recommendation <coughs> and with the previous discussions, there's almost a bit too much sort of, as it were, respect for sort of terms, definitions, standard ways of assessing things that's happening here. Um, before I get into a longer speech, I'll try and keep this mercifully short for everybody. Um, kind of, yes, okay to the recommendation. I'd probably like to come and make another speech but it is in the health. I understand we're in the health side of things here. Uh, and I'd like to ask, probably in my next speech, um, Mr Crow, a question just about literally how health risk is assessed. But um, just it needs to get under the surface of this a little bit. But, but OK, I don't want to interrupt the recommendation. Thank you. And I understand the, 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 the concerns around that. Actually, the spirit of the recommendation is within the parameters that we're told we have, um, at least to try and, and, and do something. So any, any further comments? Councillor Farquhar? I heartily welcome um, Councillor Anger's uh, input now. Um, and, I, and I agree that 
it will fall within the criteria, etc. We saw in the video which was put up there was a monitor. Well, that's, an, that's an assumption. Well, no, yeah. there, there could well be an assumption. But we saw that it did its testing. The point which I would like to make is that the nature of the testing, we just talked about cumulative effect and the fact that it does increase. So what is the worth of testing Lansdowne if you don't include the cumulative effect, e.g. you don't have lots of devices in the thousands drawing on those masks? And that's my concern to actually exactly. backing the recommendation. That's a valid point. I, I think that the, the recommendation doesn't preclude that. I think um, to, and that will be for Cabinet to decide, you know, ultimately if we are making a recommendation that in the areas where we're actually doing something that, that we monitor that, uh, that monitor is, is the, the, the word is not a limit, if you'd like, and I think that that's a, a valid point. Um, I mean, we we, are, we do have other issues to talk to um, in the the health sector. So we you know, we do have a recommendation in front, Councillor Bartlett. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Um, I think you're about to move on from the health thing after you've taken this motion and voted on it. Um, if you are, so about it now, okay, well, I'll come back if I may. Thank no, you. no, the the, uh, the idea is not to close down the discussion. It's to try and make some recommendations as we go through uh, category by category. So we have a recommendation uh, in front of us uh, regarding the deployment in Lansdowne and the, the monitoring and an urge to, to Cabinet to undertake that, and it's been duly seconded. Can I ask all those who are in favour? One, two, three, four, five, six. Thank you very much, and I can take that to cabinet for the approval, particularly with the uh, uh, this this um, uh, particular uh, item coming forward. I think very very shortly. Um, I'll move through the list, Councillor Bartlett. I think you have more points to raise on this issue. Yeah, th thank you. Um, when we started all the discussion, I, you know, I expressed my concern regarding uh, the whole issue was really about health. Is it safe? And we've been talking about monitoring what we do at Lansdowne, but the bottom line is it's about the standards that are being used and whether they're acceptable and whether if things are contained within the agreed standard, whether it's safe. Now, Public Health England's advice uh, on 5G that I've read in this paper here, it uses some pretty woolly words, actually, in my view, and it's, not un it it's perfectly understandable why people raise concerns about the safety when expressions like, and let me just quote a couple of them, their conclusions, and this is the public health advice on 5G, their conclusions support the view that health effects are unlikely to occur if the exposures are below international guidelines. So is this unlikely? It doesn't say it won't be. And just going on then, the, the Public Health England's main advice about radio waves from base stations, blah, 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 goes on, which is uh, 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 defined by the International Commission for Non-Ionising Radiation Protection. Um, and it goes on to say that it, it is a responsibility to in, uh, of industry to ensure the total exposure remains within those guidelines. So it's industry. So who's regulating industry is an immediate question. But I think this is the nitty-gritty of it for me, that when it regards to using existing base stations and converting them to 5G, we're talking about the overall exposure is expected to remain low. It doesn't say that it will. It's expected to. And it goes on to then say to ensure uh, guidelines, and therefore there, sh there should be no consequences for public health. It doesn't say there won't. There shouldn't be. So it's not a very definitive statement in a number of areas. And I believe that if, confident, if the public needs to have confidence in 5G technology, these kind of statements need to be much more carefully worded and give more confidence to, to people like myself. It can easily go one way or the other. Mr Crow, I wonder whether you wish to comment on that. I mean, we, we do, do tend to see a lot of this in these kind of documents anyway, but, um, um, yeah, comments would be very welcome. Thank you. I mean, I can't really sort of comment in detail on the, on the precise language that's used. Um, I can only believe that it stems from Public Health England being actually quite a precautionary body. So when I first came before the committee... There was a bit of discussion about the need for BCP Council to consider the, proportion, the precautionary principle when thinking about uh, 5G and any potential impact on health. And I said at the time, public health is a, a, a kind of a science and a discipline that is rooted in the precautionary principle. It was public health that pretty much invented the precautionary principle. And in all my time working with Public Health England and their, their predecessor body, which is the Health Protection Agency, I actually think they are very averse to 
putting out those very, very definitive statements in black and white terms, because obviously with the deployment of any new technology, what's really important, as we, and as, as we've heard today, is the importance of that feedback on the rollout and the implementation. There may be unintended consequences, and that's why it's important to, to, to keep that kind of monitoring and to keep the industry surveillance. I'm sorry, who said that? If we, if we, could, if we could keep the input to a minimum. It is not appropriate. We've had we've had three hours of public engagement in the first session. Sam Crow is a very respected member, not only of the council um, but of, of Dorset in general in this area, and it would be good to hear from him. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. So, as I was saying, uh, so I'm just trying to gather my thoughts again. The, I mean, in my experience, the Health Protection Agency and Public Health England are extremely cautious when they when they do formulate this advice, and that accounts for some of the language that they may be using in those statements. To come to come back to what I think is the central issue, I un, I understand the concern is we don't exactly know what the environmental exposures are going to be. We don't exactly know what what those how those are going to change depending on the number of users, the proximity to the antenna, and how those antenna are deployed. But when you look at the, the current guidelines go up to exposures of up to 300 gigahertz, which are way, way in, a, in an excess of likely exposures. I mean, we're talking about perhaps 10, 20 gigahertz maximum. I think it's my understanding that I think 28 was the, the highest level that I'd heard of. I mean, that's a, you know, an order of magnitude below what the current guidelines are based on. Um, there was also a question about how do they formulate those, those guidelines. I mean, in answer to your question, they're based on a whole range of studies. Some of those studies are recent. Some of those studies have been going back decades. But it's a whole mixture of studies of direct exposure, either to humans or to um, in vitro experiments. So they're looking at the impact of this, these exposures on cell lines to check to see if there is any DNA damage, to see if there's any effect on... Um, bio biological material. Um, it is non-ionising radiation. It's really important to understand that. So the, the power of this radiation is not powerful enough to affect electrons. It's not powerful enough to strip electrons away from cells, which is, as Director of Public Health, I'd be far more concerned about ionising radiation and exposure to the sun. Ultraviolet radiation, UVA and UVB, is ionising radiation. Even when you travel on a, on a jet... The type of exposure to ionising radiation that you experience when you're at 30,000 feet is far more powerful than what we're talking about with these deployments. So to come back to the language, I do think it's a, it's a precautionary statement. Um, I, I haven't seen anything and I haven't read of anything that leads me to believe that there should be any cause for concern whatsoever. But again, with the caveat that we need to <coughs> adhere to the international guidelines and they are very, very carefully formulated with the safety of, you know, not just operators, but the public in mind. Thank you very much. Councillor Bartlett, you wish to come back. Thank you for that excellent um, uh, statement. I, th I think the key to this is the understanding of what's ionising and what isn't, because that seems to be a, a key element in our understanding of 5G technology. The fact is it's not ionising radiation. Thank you. Um, Councillor Iyengar. The brain's thinking too fast. Absolutely no problem. Councillor Lawton. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Mr Crow, uh, you hold the role as Director of Public Health for this Council. You've held it for a number of years. Clarification. So I've been Acting Director for the past year. Uh, former to that, I was the Public Health Lead for Bournemouth Borough Council. <coughs> You are therefore under a legal obligation to ensure that the health of the residents of this borough are within the legal limits and required by law. Yes, it's a statutory role, so I'm appointed uh, in conjunction with the Secretary of State for Health, and my role is the Principal Public Health Advisor to BCP Council, and the Council in turn has a legal duty to ensure the health and well-being of its residents. So therefore, in your professional opinion... 5G does not carry a great risk to the residents of Bournemouth. Based on the caveats that I've uh, sort of mentioned in front of the committee, that as long as the exposures aren't exceeded and that the exposures remain well within the ICNRP guidelines, 
I do not believe that there is a threat to human health from 5G exposure. And in your role as Director of Public Health, you will continue to monitor and ensure that those limits are never exceeded. So working with the Council, we will keep an eye on the feedback that comes back through the monitoring of the deployments, but I also commit to working very closely with Public Health England and I'll keep the Council abreast of any updates uh, to the evidence should they become available. Thank you very much. Councillor Anger, you gathered your thoughts. <laughs> oh, OK, the pressure's on to ask a damn good question, then, really, isn't it, now? Um, I think the... Um, yeah, I got the answer to your question. Um, thank you. Um, I just wonder whether the emphasis sort of almost shifts, I'm still on health, um, to... Um, OK, the danger level is 300 gigahertz, and this is around 20. And then from the answer you gave them, Mr Crow, it says, like, how can we be sure it will remain at that level then? Because I'm inferring from that it wouldn't be. I wouldn't expect it to be your responsibility that the providers do remain below that level. What you're saying is if, from a health perspective, it remains at those low levels, there is no perceptible danger to health. So the challenge now is, will they remain? Will the providers keep it below those levels, very comfortably below those levels? I think actually this is where I was coming from <coughs> originally with my question, um, because some of the documentation that we look to for reliance on this um, is old. It doesn't mean it's still not valid, but it's old. Um, documents that say we shouldn't impose bans on minimum distances between antennae, and other one that was mentioned earlier about self-certification, which absolutely um, in other spheres has, uh, has quite, quite, quite deservedly attracted a hell of a lot of criticism, I have to say, self-certification. Um, there's also in my mind a question linked to this, which is DCMS, I understand it's well, it sent us a letter, I think I do, I do recall seeing it, about relaxing the permitted development, sorry it's planning but I'm staying on a health tack here, about relaxing permitted development, but it's unclear to me whether the Department of Health and the MHCLG, the Ministry for Housing, Communities and Local Government, has also um, endorsed that view as well, because in a sense DCMS would say that, wouldn't they? Okay. Um, back to the health thing, the final question on this, and I'm, the, the, I'm a kind of layman in this, excuse me, so I'll just kind of uh, try to ask a precise question as sort of carefully as I can. Y you Explain something, it was about 10 minutes ago, about how maybe, you know, from a health perspective, you do do studies about literally what is the impact, what is the exposure. And if I may look like it was a kind of an ex post thing, which is after sort of, after it's been running for a while, after there has been exposure, measuring it after the event. And I imagine that's, that's quite a hard thing to measure and then to isolate whether 5G has caused that, or it's other things, and it could be the case, I mean, this is an assertion, please, uh, without any fact, it could be that 5G actually is having a damaging effect, because we do have one or two uncontrolled providers of it, but the, the, the analysis wouldn't pick that up, because there's that with various other things, and it could be attributed to another cause, but actually it is the 5G that's causing that. I think you've got what I'm asking. I won't embellish it any further. I've got to feel we are taking a risk. We may be taking a risk, but we wouldn't know we're taking a risk because it wouldn't emerge uniquely in the data. Yes. Mr Crow. So you're quite right. Environmental epidemiology is extremely complicated. And for that reason, when they're assessing the safe exposure levels, they wouldn't do it by surveying populations and trying to make observations as to what might be the impact of those exposures because it's extremely difficult con to control for all the different factors, not least because we all sort of walk around in ionising radiation, which is the sun. So the, 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 the detailed work on exposure limits tends to come from very carefully laboratory-controlled experiments where they're looking at exposures up to 300 gigahertz on biological tissue. And even before that, I think, you know, we have to look at approaching the science in a stepwise fashion, the first question is, are we talking about uh, electromagnetic radiation, which is ionising or non-ionising? And it's non-ionising. So I'm struggling to see what the biological effect would be if we're talking about links with, with cancer, for example. And there have been you know, numerous scientists have, have attested to that. This is non-ionising radiation. The fact that it's non-ionising means that it doesn't have the power to strip away election, electrons from cells, 
and therefore is unlikely to lead to DNA damage. So there isn't a biological mechanism there in my mind um, that means that we should be concerned. Thank you very much, Mr. Crow. Colleagues, I'm, I'm very conscious that, that we, we have given this um, a lot of airing. Um, one of the points that I would make is that I think this whole call for evidence has been um, it's certainly been you know um, long and exhaustive, hasn't it? But this doesn't mean that this is the end of the story as well. I think we've got a few very positive recommendations to take forward, particularly to Cabinet. Um, and also um, it is within the remit of this board to decide any further work in the future that we may wish to um, undertake on this. I'm conscious that actually if the, um, the Smart Cities work is coming forward to Cabinet in January, perhaps that's another uh, opportunity to revisit some of the themes here. Um, I'm very conscious that we get feedback from the from Cabinet as to any recommendations that we have made forward, um, put forward as well. So again, that gives the Board another opportunity. Um, but we, we have actually run out of time. So if I could um, take the Board back to the recommendations that we did have in front of us on this paper. Uh, which is it's recommended the Overeem Scrutiny Board considers the responses received to the call for evidence and the officer report relating to 5G set out at appendices 1 and 2 and determines the next steps required in relation to this matter. Um, we've tried to do that as we've gone along. Um, we have um, uh, made a number of recommendations and I think in a, a very healthy way explored a number of the issues. I do hope that, that colleagues and indeed members of the public have found this process to be very useful. Um, having a call for evidence is very new for us, um, but equally it has given us an unprecedented amount of time to, to drill into some of the issues. I've certainly learnt a lot from the process and indeed I think that this is, as I mentioned earlier on, not the end of the story. Um, so unless there are any further um, uh, uh, motions or recommendations from the board, um, I'd recommend that we draw the meeting to a close. Um, Councillor Farquhar. Thank you, Chair. Um, with your permission, you did say we'd circle back round to my recommendation. Um, you, as long as it's very quick. Certainly, it was, the, uh, it was for the recommendation that the Council reaches out um, to the authorities which actually have declared a moratorium as to discover the costs that have actually been incurred under the MPPF plans whereby you cannot bar the rollout of 5G. But in addition to that coming out from the health, uh, the health side of things is that those authorities which are listed as the test beds, that this authority reaches out to them to understand what public consultation was made in those areas to the members of the public that would be in the areas that are being tested, if any. Um, if for, the, for, the, for the sake of um, democratic services, could I ask you to um, uh, put that into a sentence from a recommendation point? Certainly, it's a two-part recommendation. The first part is to reach out to those authorities that have declared a moratorium, <coughs> and if they have incurred costs by third parties that have gone um, to appeal, and what costs they, they, they incurred. And what costs those authorities have incurred? So just establish your costs. From my perspective, that's a risk if we recommend a moratorium. If they go to appeal? If they go to appeal. Could I ask, um, uh, is there a second part? The second part is health related. To reach out those, to those authorities which are listed in here that are being used as test beds. find out what consultation they did with members of the public within confines of those test beds <laughs> as regards having their permission sought to be a test subject. Mr Hale, you wish to comment on this? Just one point on the authorities, and I don't know the details of all the authorities that have um, produced an embargo on this, but most of those, I believe, are not actually planning authorities. So, um, like, uh, I think it's like North... There's parts of Somerset, uh, and I've forgotten what this might be, Safemore District Council, I think, is the local planning authority. So places like Glastonbury and that, they're not they're actually not the planning authority, so therefore, therefore would not have gone through the process and therefore incurred costs. 
Totnes again, Tainbridge is, is the planning authority, not Totnes. And, uh, and there's other places like, I don't know, Wellington is quite close to where I come from, but again, I th- it, it might be um, Somerset County Council um, or a, a wider uh, authority. It's actually the planning authority there. So it's actually determining of those authorities that are named, do they actually have the local, local planning authority responsibility? Because that might affect whether they would have done what they did. Thank you. Uh, it, 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 is, is that a recommendation to Cabinet that you're looking at? Because it has to go somewhere. Uh, Councillor Green. If, if I may, Chairman, I think we all understand what the, the gist of it is, and I might suggest that rather than having a recommendation, when you make the, your report to Cabinet, uh, you point out that our, our wish to um, find out as much as possible from other authorities who are involved in 5G as to what their effects have been on there and what sort of consultation they've had. And if you could bring that up um, to Cabinet, certainly that would satisfy me. I, I knew there was a reason you were on the board, Councillor Green. Uh, Councillor Park, are you happy with that? It does seem a sensible way forward, yes, and it certainly um, uh, adheres to the spirit of, of what you're trying to um, put forward. In which case, Councillor Anderson, yes. Thank you, Chairman. I, I just thought it would be quite useful, because we've had a lot of talk about ionising and non-ionising radiation. If I uh, suggest to Mr Crow that he gives us an example of ionising radiation, which I think if we say that X-rays and gamma radiation are ionising radiation, and most people are quite happy to have X-rays. That's, I think, duly taken on board. So, uh, In which case, if the Board is happy, I wish to thank all members of the Board. Um, this was a, a new process to us. And in particular, thank you to all of those um, members of the public and outside bodies in particular that have contributed to this. Um, it's been extremely useful. I think we've, we've learnt a lot, and um, hopefully we can keep adding um, as we learn more and more uh, into the, uh, how this works in the future. So thank you very much. Good evening.